Planning Committee on June 28th, 2022. We have a quorum and I call this meeting to order at 8.45 a.m. Uh, Mr. Price, can we start with a, a roll call, please? Brent Rubin. Here. Deborah Carpenter. Here. Dustin Bullard. Here. Jasmine Anderson. Jennifer Rangel. She will be absent today due to a conflict. Jerry Hawkins. He is here. I'm sorry. Jerry Hawkins is here. Thank you. Kristen Nightingale. Here. Linda McMahon. Here. Lynette Aguilar. Here. Matt Houston. He is here. Peter Goldstein. He'll be absent today. Roy Lopez. Thank you. All right, very good. We're going to start with the presentation from Mr. Church today uh, with the update on the WOCAP, then move into public speakers. So, Mr. Church, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Let me go ahead and share my screen and then I'll start presenting. Testing, okay. Uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, committee members. Thank you again for, for having me and for uh, ha allowing us the time to present more information about the West Oak Cliff Ferry Plan. Uh, this morning, we're going to be giving an update and, and covering some of the topics that there was a desire for there to be more information presented on. So I'll start by just kind of going over a recap briefly of the meeting last time and then go through the three main items um, which were specified by this committee to be talked about in greater detail. Those are issues related to anti-displacement policies as well as some analysis related to that, uh, missing middle housing, um, as well as um, recommendations around auto-centric businesses, and then we'll move on to next steps. Um, so just a, a quick reminder um, from, the, from the last meeting two weeks ago, uh, staff, uh, presented the, the final draft of the West Oak Cliff Area Plan, and this committee uh, desired for there to be more information on the, a displacement prevention toolkit and its relevance to this area plan, the language around auto-oriented businesses, and then language around protection of single-family character in, in missing middle housing needs in West Oak Cliff. Um, there were also some comments related to um, the history section and the language around indigenous persons in West Oak Cliff and people first language some comments about affordability around TOD, zoning impacts on auto-oriented businesses, concerns about displacement and gentrification, questions about the review process after the plan, concerns about small business and code compliance as well. So I will note that two changes to the plan have been made since that last meeting, uh, just to the body text of the document. Uh, one related to the history section, uh, based off the comments that we heard from this committee, um, and additionally, we also removed text on page 122 that made reference to potentially considerations for multifamily and townhomes around the Tyler Vernon station area. And I'll note that it actually, we uploaded a document to the website last week um, and that had not been omitted and that was uh, our, our fault and that has since been uh, updated. And so the website, the link on the website and the plan on the website should reflect that now. So I'll start by going through some of the anti-displacement tools and policies and how they relate to West Oak Cliff, um, and then I'll go through the next two sections. So to start with, uh, you know, when, we, when we started this process and when we began engaging community, the community, obviously one of the most important things that we heard throughout the process was concerns about displacement and gentrification uh, and, and how that, you know, this plan might uh, further that and exacerbate those concerns in West Oak Cliff. So something that we did as, as staff was we needed a starting point to understand what tools and policies even exist uh, on the books at City Hall today that could be implemented in, uh, in West Oak Cliff. Um, and this was something that actually 
there had never been a single uh, location where all of this information had ever been stored. Uh, that matrix has, has been shared with this committee, and I'm not going to go through all of the details because obviously there's a lot of data in there. Um, but what I will say is, you know, what we found is that there's really three main departments that control or uh, have policies that speak to tools that could potentially help mitigate displacement. Uh, for planning and urban design, those tools are all zoning related. So there's neighborhood stabilization overlays, conservation districts, accessory dwelling unit overlays, and the mixed income housing bonus. Economic development uh, manages TIF projects and tax incentivized projects. Those projects, if they're providing if they're providing any sort of residential component are required to have 20% of those units to be income restricted for 80% AMI or less. And then as you can see, the housing department is obviously the department that has the greatest amount of policies and tools um, related to um, displacement and affordability. Everything from neighborhood empowerment zones and community land trust to our land bank program, home improvement loans, things like that. So the next step for us to think through was, well, what are the, what are the four main strategies or, or, or buckets of, of tactics that a, a city, any city, can use to address affordability uh, citywide? And those really fall into, you know, based off all the research that we found, that really fall into four main categories. You can create and preserve dedicated affordable units. So these are income-restricted units that... Um, you know, are managed by our housing department or through DHA or some sort of entity like that. There are, there's reducing barriers to new supply, knowing that more supply equals less demand and helps reduce price. Um, then there's helping households access and become homeowners in the, in the market. And then lastly, there's establishing protections against displacement and poor housing conditions. So what that looks like here in Dallas kind of gone through some of them in terms of creating and preserving dedicated units that could be those could be LIHTC units set aside units managed by our housing department DHA other mixed income development um, in order to reduce barriers to new supply those strategies would be things such as upzoning to allow for more density allowing missing middle housing types to increase housing options um, expedited review uh, you know, providing incentives in the zoning that, that encourage people to provide dedicated affordable units. In terms of helping households access and afford homes, that's really just um, having people, helping people to become homeowners. So that's everything from low interest loans, down payment assistance. And then on the last bucket, uh, establishing protections against displacement and poor housing conditions, that's things such as rent and eviction protections, stricter code enforcement, um, rehabilitation of existing housing stock. So that's really kind of the, all of the tools that exist here in the Dallas area that are at our disposal. So in terms of what, what we're addressing in West Oak Cliff and through the area plan, um, we have strategies related to each of these four, uh, this, this four-pronged approach. I um, mean, we think that that's really important because um, all four are needed in order to have a, a successful strategy related to mitigating displacement and gentrification. Uh, so some of those recommendations include what we talked about last time in creating a mixed income community at the Hampton Dart Station property. Um, there is a TIF district in the northern portion of West Oak Cliff. That's, that is a, uh, a TIF district that there has been no development that's tapped into that TIF in West Oak Cliff so far, but if a development was going to, um, they would be required to set aside 20% of their units as affordable. Um, we're making recommendations around missing middle housing, which I'll talk about here in a second, an expedited review process, the mixed income housing bonus. Um, for item number three, uh, we're recommending that our housing department with planning and urban designs assistance conduct a comprehensive outreach effort to educate about home bu the homebuyer assistance program, tax exemptions, and other programs that can assist uh, residents become homeowners um, and, and know some strategies that they have to help reduce their tax burden. And then lastly, uh, related to mitigations against displacement, displacement and poor housing conditions, creation of a neighborhood empowerment zone, additional funding for our HIP and TARP programs, that's housing improvement and repair, um, and then also utilization of the city's title and property assistance program with a dedicated outreach in West Oak Cliff. And that's something that um, it's, it's targeted in ge geographies, and West Oak Cliff is not one of their geographies currently. 
Um, something else that you know came from this committee also related to concerns about well, if if we allow some missing middle housing types and theoretically or, or through that process change the zoning to allow for things such as ADUs and duplexes, could that have the effect of increasing land values and, and thus increasing tax burdens and, and, and furthering displacement and gentrification? What, what I will say is we can't obviously know what the housing market is going to do, uh, but we could evaluate and look at areas that exist today in West Oak Cliff where there are differences in the zoning and, and evaluate the land values there. And so what we did was look at areas that are R75 that are adjacent to other properties that are zoned either TH3 or MF2. Those are properties that have higher entitlement rights, um, but the, in, in these areas such as Jimtown and some other areas in West Oak Cliff, the land uses in those areas are either single family or duplexes. Um, so, the, so they're not fully built out to those, uh, to those entitlements yet. But what we found is that land values are actually marginally less on the higher zoned properties. It's, it was really a, a matter of the lot size. Um, so if, as you can tell, it's not a whole lot of difference. But what we did find is that there is no difference in land values of properties that are zoned TH3 or MF2 versus those directly across the street that are zoned R75. So you know, one thing that is worth noting is it is possible, again, we don't know what the housing market can do, and it's impossible to fully predict that, but it is possible that land values could escalate in the future if the zoning was changed, but it's also worth noting that that additional units would be permitted on those properties, and so the tax burden has the ability to be shared across multiple parties, which obviously is not permitted today. Um, and one thing I'll also just kind of add at the end of all of this is that while housing and issues of affordability and displacement obviously have their roots in land use and have their roots in development. Specific policies related to housing must be in, in, or, or have to be addressed by our housing department. Um, they've got a, uh, an entire task force being created to create and, and identify additional tools and strategies that the city can use. Um, but we, you know, we really were restricted to only work within the existing tools and policies that exist in the city of Dallas today. Uh, so this is not you know, the West Oak Cliff plan is not specifically a housing plan, although we know it's important to have policies and strategies related to housing in the plan. So one of those topics that I did talk about uh, related to creating new supply uh, was, was missing middle housing and having additional housing choice options. And something that this committee had desired to learn more about was that topic specifically and also uh, topics related to design standards that to ensure that if missing middle housing is added into some areas in West Oak Cliff, that it's context sensitive um, and doesn't dramatically change the character of these neighborhoods. So I'll start by just explaining where we're recommending missing middle housing types be permitted. Uh, currently, the plan recommends within a half mile of the Tyler Vernon and the Hampton Dart Station uh, light rail stations that missing middle housing types be considered through a future zoning change. Uh, that would, could either be through a conservation district, through some sort of a zoning overlay, or through that new infill residential zoning category that would have to be created in our city code, which I talked about last time. That said, we're not recommending um, all of these missing middle housing types to be permitted on all properties. So we are recommending that accessory dwelling units and duplexes be allowed on all residentially zoned lots. Um, so that's all, those are kind of all the gray boxes that you see on the map there. Um, in terms of triplexes, we're only recommending that these be permitted on lots. And again, this is just a starting point for discussion for what would be a future zoning change. This is not, this has not become policy when this is adopted. This is just a guide for the future. But the recommendation is for triplexes to be permitted on lots that are 10,000 square feet in size or larger. Again, this area is largely R75, so the most lots are 7,500 square feet in size. Uh, so there are not a whole lot of lots that are larger, but there are some. So for triplexes, that's a little more than 11% of the total lots, and those are what you see on the map in yellow. And it's also worth noting that a lot of those properties that you see in yellow are schools, churches, or lots that have some pretty substantial topography or floodplain issues. And so even though they might be larger in size, their development is limited because of that. And so it's, it's the 11% is definitely not 
uh, what, what you would see because many of these are, are held by churches and things of that nature. Uh, for quadplexes, we're, we, the recommendation is for them to be considered on lots that are 15,000 square foot in size or on corner lots that are 10,000 square foot in size or larger. So that's only 4% of the total residential lots in the area. Cottage courts would be permitted on lots larger than 20,000 square feet in size. So that's 1.6% of the total lots. And the narrow, narrow lot single family, which is essentially taking a duplex and splitting it into two separate housing structures, those would be permitted on lots that are extra wide and extra deep, which is about 2% of the total lots in, this, in these areas. So next I'll just kind of highlight what we're talking about when we talk about missing middle housing. We're talking about neighborhood scaled housing that looks like and feels like a single family neighborhood, but simply has more residential units in those, uh, in those buildings because of how they're subdivided. Uh, th there's a lot of existing examples of this in Dallas. Uh, Kings Highway is, is one that, that example is actually new construction. That's a conservation district just north of West Oak Cliff. That's a quadplex right there, but because of the conservation district, it's required to meet various design standards so that it's reflective of the surrounding community and looks like the existing housing stock in the area. And West Oak Cliff specifically also has examples of missing middle housing. Those two bottom pictures just show some examples of a quadplex and a duplex that already exist in the area. And those were grandfathered in um, before the zoning was changed uh, in the 60s. So the plan has an entire section about design considerations for missing middle housing. I'm not gonna go through each recommendation, um, but, but I will touch on the fact that for the setbacks and massing, the recommendation is that even if we're permitting there to be additional dwelling units on a lot, that the setbacks and massing would still be required to follow R75 requirements. Um, so they, you know, they would, by default, couldn't be any larger than what a person could already do building a single family home there. Uh, for parking, the parking requirements would be the same. Um, we also have recommendations related to um, where garages are placed, how open space is considered on the site, um, driveways, all of those are, are, can, are important to think about how we're, if, if residential infill does occur over time, how we're ensuring that new development, new construction fits into the neighborhood, contributes to it as a single family uh, residential feeling neighborhood that has porches and um, feels like the neighborhood character that already exists. I think what, what we all know, what, you know, we've seen examples of duplexes in Dallas that are two garage doors that take up the entire front of the facade and we're trying to avoid that. And it's really important that there's recommendations that speak to that and so these do do that. Something else that came up in the last meeting related to platting. We do currently have a bullet point in there that states the combination of two adjacent lots into one single lot for the sake of allowing additional density is not preferred. Um, we're also recommending that there be considering, considering adding an additional bullet, which is consider a maximum lot size that is no larger than 25% larger than the average of a given block face as determined on a block by block basis. And what that's really getting at is we know that there's obviously some variation within uh, blocks or lot size on, on any block face, but by having it be no more than 25% larger, that would ensure that um, even if a lot is marginally larger, it's not gonna be a double lot that feels out of scale from the, from the surrounding properties around it. And then related to architectural requirements, uh, our recommendation is that th there's, a, there's a request by communities around some of these stations like Elmwood and Hampton Hills to consider conservation districts. Those are the, through the conservation district process, that's the best place to determine those really specific architectural details, such as roof slope pitches, uh, facade materials. And so that's best, that's best handled through that process. And it's important that that is uh, done accordingly if, if those neighborhoods do d decide to move forward with conservation districts. But it's also worth noting that our current R75 zoning has no architectural requirements besides setback and massing. And so any sort of infill residential or overlay district that would be created, we're recommending that at a minimum that there is some sort of design guidance as outlined on these last two slides, which would provide dramatically more guidance than what our current zoning has today. 
So I'm not going to go through all of the recommendations for each of the different uh, missing middle types, but what I will say is that the document has a page for each housing type choice and kind of shows uh, best practices for those. So for a duplex, as I mentioned, obviously trying to avoid the, the double garage and double driveway that we see so common and instead have it be, uh, you know, parking in the rear, driveways off an alley if that exists, uh, with porches and front doors that fa uh, face the street and as well as setbacks that are it, the same as existing single family setbacks. Uh, same for triplexes and, and quadplexes, locating parking uh, away from the street to not be visible, uh, direct entries from the street, ensuring scale compatibility with surrounding properties. For the cottage courts, um, a max, max density of 16 units per acre, um, max unit size, typically cottage courts are 1,500 square foot homes or smaller, and so, you know, codifying that would be important. Um, parking requirements that are in line with R75, but also allow for some visitor parking. Um, and also ensuring that uh, setbacks um, are in line with the existing setbacks. So you can see from those two, get two diagrams, there are some example lots like this in West Oak Cliff where we get some really large, deep lots where currently today you could only build a single family home, but it might make sense to build uh, a couple smaller homes on those properties, but ensuring that those homes um, fit into the neighborhood through, through scale and setbacks and, and other design, design means. So last, I'll touch on the topic of the auto-oriented businesses and our recommendations. So what I'll start with is, you know, how did we get to, to the recommendations that we have? So, I'll, you know, there's, when we think of car-oriented businesses versus walkable neighborhood streets, the two pictures that you see on the, upper, on the upper right are examples here in Dallas. One is Greenville Avenue, the other one is Clarendon um, at a gas station at Hampton Road. What we know just through experience is, you know, as all of us have experienced as a pedestrian, issues that have locations that have narrow sidewalks, wide curb cuts, fast moving roadways directly adjacent to that, um, and, you know, minimal pedestrian infrastructure, those are places that feel unsafe for pedestrians. What we heard through the engagement process uh, in, through, this, uh, through the last two years, and specifically for Hampton Clarendon, but also for other areas in West Oak Cliff, is that there's a strong desire for these areas to be more walkable and to, for them to be neighborhood scale districts that provide a variety of community amenities. And so these, these pictures that you see on the bottom left, uh, bottom, uh, sorry, bottom right, are ones that we actually used through visual preference, uh, preference surveys um, that people reacted very positively and strongly to. So, also, uh, next I'll go through kind of the way the iterations of, of the draft and this recommendation have changed for item 1C for Hampton Clarendon. Um, but it's also the same wording that's being considered for the other focus areas as well. So, in the draft that we presented back in March, uh, the recommendation initially was consider amending the zoning to prohibit automotive-centric uses, including drive through restaurants, drive through banks, car washes, gas stations, and auto repair shops, in order to facilitate the type of walkable mixed-use development desired by the community. What we presented two weeks ago was a recommendation that had been reworded with input from our task force. They, they actually, the task force were the ones who wrote this, and it was consider amending the zoning to limit future land uses that do not align with the type of walkable neighborhood serving development desired by the community, including uses that may impede pedestrian mobility due to multiple curb cuts, parking locations, and hazardous vehicular pedestrian conflict points. What we are recommending as staff uh, is considering changing that even further to be the following. Consider amending the zoning to ensure future land uses provide pedestrian-oriented design through public, realm, through public realm design and building placement, utilizing design standards to enhance pedestrian mobility by minimizing curb cuts, parking locations, hazardous vehicular pedestrian con and, and hazardous vehicular pedestrian conflict points. Um, what, I'll, what I'll say about this recommendation is first, um, that does not make any sort of current use such as auto repair shops non-conforming. All it, all it states is that any new development would have to adhere to those design standards. Um, it also would not be re retroactively applied to existing bus businesses. If there is a desire through the authorized hearing in Hampton, Clarendon, or these other areas to make a use non-conforming, that would be determined through the authorized hearing process. 
and it's possible that you know the the business owners in the surrounding uh, communities are interested in making gas stations or drive-through restaurants non-conforming. That's something that can be determined through the authorized hearing process. Um, this recommendation here would simply uh, mean that future land uses would be held to a stricter design standard. And one thing that did come up from the last committee meeting was a question about, well, if a use is non-conforming or an existing structure um, obviously doesn't meet those design requirements, what happens if they want to expand? That would be something that could be written into a PD or written into the language for the zoning. But one thing that we did look at was our Article 13, which is our form-based districts. They have some language in, in, that, in that section of our code. And that states that unless the expansion is 35% or larger of the existing floor plate, then it wouldn't be required to follow those design requirements. Uh, so unless it's a really large expansion, um, there, this, this uh, recommendation or this, this zoning change would not apply. So when we think about some of those design best practices for car-oriented uses, those include locating the building adjacent to the sidewalk, um, minimal setback from the sidewalk and having active ground level uh, entries and, and windows, patios and street trees and other placemaking amenities as warranted, locating parking in the rear of the structure or to the side of the structure, um, and no more than 50% of a lot frontage being taken up by parking and also narrowing driveway entries to the greatest extent possible. And again, just want to reiterate that this would not apply to current businesses. It would just be for any new construction that came to the area. So these pictures, that's an example of a gas station um, in a form-based district in Jacksonville, Florida, as well as a car wash. Um, th these next two pictures are a, a tire shop in California. Um, where everything's to the side while there's still a well-designed, comfortable sidewalk in the front. And then the bottom picture is actually a drive-through in a form-based district in Irving, Texas. So in terms of next steps, uh, staff's recommendation is for uh, endorsement with any requested comments of the shared final draft of the area plan by this committee in order to advance it to City Plan Commission for review and recommendation to City Council. Um, and if that is, you know, based on our discussion today, and if that is the course uh, uh, recommended, then this, uh, this plan would move forward to City Plan Commission on July 21st, and then on to City Council in August. So with that, I'll, I'm happy to take any questions and go back through the slides as needed. Great, all right. Um, members, do you have questions for Mr. Church or any other members of the staff? Uh, Mr. Carpenter? I'm sorry to interrupt. Matt Houston has stepped away. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Carpenter, whenever you're ready. Yes, I have a great many questions, but um, are we gonna listen to the speakers here first? Mr. Body, do you have a preference either way? I have a preference to hear the speakers okay. first. Okay, great, then let's go to public speakers now. I've got a list um, of folks, um, and I will read out the speaker who's up as well as the next two, I guess the, the folks who are on deck and in the hall so you can line up and be ready. And we are going to do one minute per speaker today. Our first speaker is Myra Chavez, then Christine Hopkins, followed by Evelyn Mayo. Is Myra Chavez here? <laughs> Good morning, and be sure to start with your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Myra Chavez. I live at 1102 South Polk Street, and I am well. First, good morning. I'd like to thank you for taking time to uh, hear our community. Um, so I've lived at this address my entire life with my parents. Um, we are those who would be affected by the South Edge Field, um, the creative density, the middle housing type. Um, so first, uh, my parents heard about this plan through word of mouth um, by my next door neighbor. Um, I don't feel as if, as if there was enough money or anything allocated to notify the, the community about what's going on. Um, we heard through word of mouth and 
I have kept in touch with our, well, it's not even our neighborhood association president um, through Yolanda. She's been a great help as, as to letting the community know, especially through the Nextdoor app. Um, and then even following community members um, such as Giovanni, who have been letting the public know about meetings so we can attend. So um, at first, uh, my parents had heard about it. Uh, Ms. Chavez, that's your time. All right, Christine Hopkins, Evelyn Mayo, then Barbara Barbie. Good morning, my name is Christine Hopkins. I live at 1118 Elmwood Boulevard. Um, Myra Chavez is one of the neighbors that I've met and helped block walk with, and I'm gonna follow up on what she was saying. The neighborhoods uh, north of Tyler, Vernon Dart Station do not want this missing middle housing change. They've made their voices clear in a petition. I've worked with Somos Tejas and West Oak Cliff Coalition to get their voices heard, and their voices should be listened to. Um, I don't think that there are adequate legal rails on this missing middle housing type to force this neighborhood into an experiment that they don't want. On page 108 of the plan about platting, it says that replatting is not preferred. I hope someone will ask me a follow-up question about this. I don't know how much I can explain in one minute. But there is a development code on the books, 51.A-8.503A, and it will be up to the city's attorney's office to determine how that will be interpreted when there is now all of a sudden quadplexes, triplexes, different lot sizes allowed and development allowed in an area. And what we really need is we need the city to make a zoning overlay or ordinance that protects this area against replatting, make sure this development code applies, and we want the maximum lot size that is under consideration. We Ms. Hopkins, thank you, that's your time. Thank you. All right, next up, Evelyn Mayo, followed by Barbara Barbie, followed by Albert Mata. Thank you, Evelyn Mayo, 7732 Village Trail Drive. I have a clarifying question for staff, is that okay? for the language proposed? This is the time for, for public comments. If you want to raise it, then members of the commission okay. body can ask. Great, so the changes to the auto repair shops, was that for all three locations of concern? So Elmwood, Tyler, and uh, Hampton, Clarendon? Okay, if, if yes, I would just like that confirmed. The second thing is this entire presentation was in English and uh, no Spanish translation, and I just know that most of the audience here doesn't uh, speak English, so. I think that's gonna make it challenging for them to respond to the presentation. Um, and then the third thing I wanted to say was, there is continuously this um, reflection on the engagement process, but clearly none of these folks were engaged and this will have substantial implications for them because this plan is going to be adopted and Forward Dallas will be informing zoning changes in the future. So it just feels disingenuous to be saying this will have no impact on their businesses if they are specifically uh, mentioning them, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayo, Barbara Barbie, followed by Albert Mata, followed by Alejandro Valdez. Good morning, my name is Barbara Barbie. I live at 303 North Barnett. I'm president of Beverly Hills Neighborhood Association. Um, I wrote a letter, you have a copy of my letter that I wrote about this plan. I was on this WOCAP committee from the beginning, and I wrote the letter before I had had time to read the entire document. I'm very concerned about what's going to happen to my neighborhood because it's wedged between Davis, Westmoreland, and Jefferson. Um, I think that my neighborhood is probably going to end up totally destroyed um, by the, what's coming down uh, West Davis Street. Um, Maybe, maybe um, we'll survive, but I don't think so. This is an old neighborhood. It's been there for over 100 years. Many of the houses are very old, but they're very well kept. Uh, it's a Hispanic neighborhood. They're 85% of our neighbors are Hispanic. Uh, they're not engaged. And to suggest that uh, getting a conservation district would probably protect a neighborhood like mine is futile because there's no way that we're going to be able to organize uh, an attempt to put a conservation district in this neighborhood. I'm Thank you, Ms. Barbie. All right, 
Albert Mara, followed by Alejandro Valdez, followed by Jose Nieto. My name is Albert Mata. I live at 111 West Davis Street, Dallas, Texas, about 208. Uh, and I want to follow up on the comments Christine Hopkins and Myra Chavez made around the middle housing. I'm in the neighborhood just north of uh, the Tyler Burns Station called South Edgefield. Uh, well, I request the committee advise city staff to remove the language to better reflect the will of the community as collected through the surveys that we have administered in this area. Uh, and a response may be that this can be more properly adjudicated through the authorized hearing process, but we believe that if a land use plan is meant to be the vision of the community, then it should contain that. And we shouldn't be pushing the can down the road. Additionally, on page 50 of the plan, there's a land use map that features light blue sections, description of a commercial center and corridors. That description features a language that mentions multifamily. Our concern is that this map mentions multifamily in areas where they currently do not exist. There was an agreement between task force, staff, and the community that recommendations will not be made to the areas on the western side of the WOCAP boundaries because they did not have any neighborhood representation on the task force. Uh, land use maps and the area plans are important references for future zoning cases, so we request the committee to buy city staff to amend the wording on that map to reflect no changes in the term Thank you, Mr. Mata. Alejandro Valdez, followed by Jose Nieto, followed by Enrique Subias. Buenos dias. Uh, soy Jose Nieto de Champions Auto Service. Uh, hold on just one second. Do we have a translator? Are you able to translate? I can try. Ms. Gillis, okay. All right, and for speakers who, who um, are choosing to use a translator, we give each of these speakers two minutes consistent with what council does. Whenever y'all are ready. Good, good, oh, dear. good morning. Soy Jose Nieto de Champions Auto Service. Uh, my name is Jose Nieto from Champions Auto Service. A los miembros del departamento de la ciudad de, de Dallas. Um, he's greeting the, oh. the Department of the City of Dallas. Con todo respeto, nos vemos en la necesidad de pedirles que tengan consideración de nuestras de, de nosotros como seres humanos, gente trabajadora, honesta y responsable que con nuestro por nuestro negocio ya están hemos estado trabajando y, y en nuestro negocio ya estamos sobreviviendo para um, he, it's um, saying with all due respect, he's asking as, um, as human beings, as owners of businesses, he's directing his comments to this committee. Perdón. Bien, eh, con todo respeto, les pedimos que tengan consideración de, de nosotros, de nuestro negocio, de nuestra gente responsable, que es, con, es, con ellos estamos sobreviviendo. And we hope that you'll take into consideration our businesses and that you'll respect that um, our work in in the area. Bien, con el esfuerzo de nuestras nuestro trabajo, que pues este mantenemos nuestras familias de esta manera. Si esto se lleva a cabo, sería un gran we, we, we support our families with this work, and if this were to go into place, this would be a tragedy for our families and to be able to support our families. Asimismo, les pedimos de la manera más atenta y cordial, tomando en consideración que no se lleve a cabo este plan. With all, with all due respect, we um, we ask that you don't move forward with this plan. All right. Th thank you so much, sir.
Uh, was that Mr. Valdez or Mr. Nieto? Nieto. Nieto, okay. All right, then next up, Enrique Subias, Jorge Flores, followed by Baltazar Montelongo. Hola, buenos días. Eh, mi nombre es Enrique Subias, vivo en uh, 3414 Texas Drive. Bien, yo estoy aquí porque creo... And if you could, sir, just give her a chance to... I'm sorry. Could you repeat your name? Uh, su nombre otra vez? Enrique Subías. Did you get that? Enrique Subías? Okay. Uh, bien. Eh, pienso que algunos de ustedes no saben el esfuerzo que hemos hecho de estar ahí por algunos años, sacar un negocio de, de cero. Um, I, he, was, he wants you to understand the... the um, the strength or the the work that has to go into creating a business from 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 scratch para este ganarnos la confianza de nuestros clientes y poderles ofrecer buenos precios que en los lugares de los dealers donde posiblemente van a a, a ir si si cierran nuestros negocios to gain the confidence of customers and also to gain the connections with our dealers to be able to to make things work for our business van a ser extremadamente costosos. Tratamos de ayudar a, a, a las familias que están cerca de, de nuestra comunidad. It's going to be very expensive to try to continue to help support um, the families that are close to our community. Creo que no es una gran diferencia. Mis respetos para ustedes. Creo que no saben lo duro que ha sido para nosotros salir adelante. Porque I, gracias a Dios ustedes tienen ya un trabajo aquí y nosotros hemos sacado de abajo. He wants you to understand how difficult it's been for them. He feels that you can't quite understand how difficult it has been for them to, to bring this from the ground up and to, to create this business from, from scratch, from zero. Nosotros hemos salido adelante, gracias a Dios. Y mi respeto para ustedes nuevamente, pero creo que es más fácil tomar decisiones ustedes aquí sentados que nosotros estar ahí el día al día en el calor, en el frío, atendiendo a nuestros clientes. And with respect, um, he thinks that it's easier for you to make the decisions here, but, um, you know, they're on the ground day in and day out, um, you know, working hard in the cold, in the, uh, in the heat, um, trying to make their business work. Otro último punto. Quiero hacer pensar que aproximadamente hace entre seis o, seis o ocho años no han mandado inspectores a que estén pendientes De, de lo que está pasando ahí porque es han, para mí la misma ciudad ha dejado que estos problemas crezcan. And um, he said one last point is that he, there haven't been any inspectors by the city sent out in the last six to eight years, so he thinks part of the problem has been facilitated through lack of city attention. Y pues, este, Thank you, sir. Gracias. All right, uh, Jorge Flores, followed by Baltazar Montelongo, followed by Jose Garcia. Is Mr. Flores here? All right, how about Baltazar Montelongo? Appears that Mr. Flores might be online. Mr. Flores, are you there? Might be a different Flores. All right. Uh, Baltasar Montelongo. Jose Garcia. And then after Mr. Garcia, it would be Samuel Narvaez and then Oscar Gomez. Buenos días. Uh, mi nombre es Jose Garcia. Soy dueño de Alamo Auto Sales. Uh, my name is Jose Garcia. I am the owner of Alamo Auto Sales. Eh, al igual que yo, las personas que estamos aquí somos dueños de negocios establecidos desde hace muchos años. Um, we are um, just like the others where I'm here as a business owner um, who's been an owner of a business here for many years. 
cuya economía familiar depende al 100% de nuestro trabajo y de nuestro servicio que hacemos a la comunidad. My family um, depends 100% on my business um, and the, the work that we do with, within this community. Al igual somos fuente de empleo, todos tenemos trabajadores cuyas familias al igual dependen de lo que nosotros produzcamos en, en nuestros negocios. We are also a, a, a source of employment for um, individuals in the community and we provide that support and also earnings to, to those, to our employers. Con todo respeto, pido de favor, nos dejen seguir operando sin olvidar que nuestro servicio a la comunidad es, es esencial para todos. Um, and with all respect, that we hope that you remember that our um, work in the community and the work that we do is, is, is an essential business and that we want to continue performing that business. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, Samuel Narvaez, followed by Oscar Gomez, followed by Pedro Sarmiento. Good morning. Uh, I'm Oscar Gomez. Uh, Samuel Narvaez is my uncle, and uh, I would just like to bring up some points that he relayed to me. Um, we discussed, and pretty much the points that he would like to bring forward is uh, how long he's been in business. He's been in business since the late 90s. Um, through his job, through his business, he's been able to not only provide for his family, uh, but also for other members of the community. Every year, uh, the shop donates to the Fraternal Order of Police. Um, you know, our customers are firemen, they are police officers, teachers, they are members of the community. Um, the Cocker Hill Police Station is pretty much right down the street from us. Uh, the, there's a firehouse right down the street from us. We have customers that we can see from the backyard of our shop. We are the community that's going to be affected. Um, and the point that he's putting, that he wanted me to pretty much relay is that we are the community that this plan is going to affect, and we were not notified. Thank you, sir. All right, next up, Pedro Sarmiento, followed by Gerardo Figueroa, followed by Vanessa Saldana. Is Mr. Sarmiento here or online? I don't see him online. Gerardo Figueroa? Uh, please note the, the back doors are still locked. If you need to go to the restroom or leave the building, just go to your right, and uh, Lawrence should be over there to guide you out. Thank you. Hello, good morning. My name is Gerardo Figueroa. Today I'm here representing my business at 2220 West Clarendon Drive. And I am here to speak on the words in the WOCAP project that will relate to auto-centric businesses, curb cuts and the correlation that the city has made between the two of these. In this plan, the city has said that auto-centric uses don't align with the new vision that the community wants. Daniel says we don't understand what's going to happen, that nothing will happen to automotive businesses, that we will be as we have always been. But that is not true. We are the people that know exactly what will happen because we have all seen it and we have all lived it. We saw Bishop Arts overtake the, or, the area of Oak Cliff, a once thriving community of Hispanic businesses, citizens, and a whole lot of automotive businesses have been reduced to bars, no parking, heavy traffic, apartments, and gentrification. The WOCAP plan says it wants to maintain the look and feel of the neighborhood. Well, we are the look and feel of the neighborhood. We are there day in and day out before this neighborhood became desirable to others. The city says it wants to promote walkability. That's great. My uncles, friends, and customers have lived there their whole lives, and most of them walk everywhere in these neighborhoods. To say auto-centric uses can't coexist with a walkable neighborhood is wrong. Most of the complaints about walkability. Thank you, Mr. Figueroa. Thank you. All 
All right, Vanessa Saldana, followed by Yolanda Almeida, followed by Mario Almanza. Uh, my name is Vanessa Saldana, representing my business, Aiden State Inspection Number 4, located at 1153 Southampton Road. Is your microphone on, ma'am? Yes. Okay, great. Is this better? Okay, sorry. Would you like me to repeat that again? Let's start her time over, since we had mic issues. My name is Vanessa Saldana. I'm here representing my business, State, Aiden State Inspection Number 4, located at 1153 Southampton. Um, I was asked a question last time as what I could do to help the people who wanted the bulk cap. I did say that I would want to speak to them. I did that. I spoke to nearly 100 people. Out of those 100 people, only three of them knew what woke cap was. One was for it. One actually attended the meeting. Upon attending the meeting, he said he felt unwelcomed. He felt awkward. He felt awkward because he didn't understand anything that anybody was saying because it was English speaking only. The community that we live, it, live in is filled with a lot of Latino, Spanish speakers. I think this should have been something that the city could have worked on better to be able to spread what was happening. The city staff gave lots of numbers and how much input they received based on my experience, I think y'all should take it with a grain of salt because it doesn't really reflect what our community wants. Thank you, Ms. Saldana. I think Yolanda Almeida is online. And then after that, it's Mario Almanza followed by Patrick Ford. Buenos oh, dias. Oh, sir. Don't hear most speaker. Hi, this is Yolanda. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Whenever you're ready. All right. I'm ready. Two minutes. Hello um, to you guys, um, the chair and club members. I wanted to, um, my name is Yolanda Alameda. I reside at 1607 South Tyler Street, and I urge you to recommend the removal of language that threatens small auto-centric businesses and is in conflict with the plan's community vision. And as a point of clarification related to Evelyn Mayo's question, on page 81, there is a recommendation to consider amending the existing CR zoning to prohibit, to prohibit auto-centric uses in the Elmwood area. As a task force member, I've read several iterations of this document, and each time I read it, I find conflicts or nu nuances in the narrative. For example, our community vision on page 47, 42 specifically states that we want a sustainable neighborhood that supports local minority women and immigrant owned local businesses. But on page 47, it calls for zoning changes to eliminate undesirable commercial uses and that they need to be excluded. Also, in today's presentation, uh, Mr. Church explains that the community is very interested in walkability, but I've heard from other task force members and community members that they didn't understand that creating walkability would lead to targeting local small businesses. Thank you, Ms. Almeida. That's your time. Uh, I want to just end by saying it's a compliment. Ms. Almeida, that's your time. Thank you. I understand, but don't be rude. Uh, to come Ms. Almeida, the thank you very much. We've given each speaker an equal amount of time. All right, next up we have Mario Almanza. Eh, buenos días, antes que todo. Eh, Dios les bendiga en esta mañana. Um, before anything, I want to, um, God bless you this morning. Eh, estamos aquí reunidos todos y cada uno de nuestros compañeros. Um, we're all here together this morning. Eh, pidiéndoles eh, en el amor de Cristo. I'm asking you for the love of God que tomen en consideración cada uno de nuestros negocios that you take into consideration each of our businesses en el cual eh, sabemos que es indispensable para la comunidad de Oclip we know that they're um, in indispensable um, very necessary to, to the y neighborhood no, no, of Oclip y no nomás para la comunidad de Oclip and not just for Oclip sino también para nuestras familias que viven fuera de este país but also for our families that live outside of this country. El negocio mío. My business. Ezio Car Car. Eh, es un lugar donde también su servidor ayuda a asilos que se encuentran fuera de este país. 
Um, it's also a business that helps people um, that are outside of this country. Les rogamos we beg que tomen en cuenta el sacrificio y el trabajo que nosotros desempeñamos en ese lugar that you take into consideration the sacrifice and the work that we've put into this business. Y que tratamos de hacer lo mejor para que esa comunidad se sienta bien. And that we try to do everything that we can so Somos that this community feels good. We're honest people. Responsable de nuestro trabajo. Responsible in our work. Porque queremos que nuestras familias sean eh, eh, familia de bien. We want our, our families to be um, good standing families. Para esta nación. For this country. No queremos que nuestra familia sean como jóvenes delincuentes. We don't want um, sino, our families to be uh, sino, have sin, youth delinquency. Sino enseñarles que tenemos que salir adelante respetando las leyes de este lugar. But teaching um, teaching our youth the, how to move forward and respect the laws of this country. Les quiero dar gracias y que Dios les bendiga. Um, I want to give you thank and God thank you and God bless. Thank you, sir. All right, next up we have Patrick Ford, followed by Cynthia Jaimes, followed by Maria Garcia. Good morning, my name is Pat Ford. I live at 633 North Manus. That's adjacent to the Tyler Vernon Station. I understand uh, what staff said about page 122, removing townhomes and multifamily up to three stories in the draft. I printed this off at 7.30 last night. It was still in there. Point of order, how can you take action on something that is 16 hours old, maybe? Because evidently the revision has happened this morning or something like that. I would also point out to the earlier point about some inconsistencies in the document, page 50, it still says townhomes and multifamilies. Uh, that is not something any of these neighborhoods want. It's something outside people want, and it's not what our neighborhood needs to thrive. It's a working neighborhood. I've said this before. If it's working, let's don't try to fix what works. And the whole thing about we're going to take care of people, there are single owner, single families that live in these houses and that have lived there for a long time. We need to leave them alone and not allow the replatting and the lot breaking and the block breaking that is going to happen with this multifamily upzoning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Next up, Cynthia Jaimes, followed by Maria Garcia, followed by Catherine Rosas. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can, but the text and open meeting acts require that we, we have your camera on in order to be able to hear from you online. Are you able to turn your camera on? Um, there we go. Now we can see you whenever you're ready. Hi, my name is Cynthia Jaimes. I am a lifelong Oak Cliff resident and a business owner here. I urge you to remove the language that is proposed in the WOCAP recommendations that directly impact and potentially jeopardize these small automotive businesses. These businesses have been here much longer than WOCAP and have been here before this neighborhood was desirable for the consumption of others. Dallas has the opportunity to lead in innovative resolutions in which we can work with the neighborhood and not against it and actually have equitable change for the businesses that have already been here. I've heard in countless meetings about walkability, but we live in a neighborhood that doesn't even have sidewalks already and doesn't provide the resources for the residents that are already here. Instead, it is only talking about the potential the neighborhood has for others. I would urge you to please listen to the people that are here today and all the people that haven't had the opportunity to go because we have made this neighborhood where it is today. We shouldn't have to fight for a seat at the table. We helped make the table. Thank you so much, Ms. Jaimes. Maria Garcia, followed by Catherine Rosas, followed by Victoria Farrell Ortiz. Is Maria Garcia here? All right, Catherine Rosas. Hi. 
I'm Catherine Rosas, a lifetime resident of Oak Cliff at 524 South Brighton. Since returning from university, I have begun to participate in community engagement in the form of block walking, providing community educational material, and documenting opinions on these changes, and specifically WOCAP. My neighborhood has voiced exclusion from essential conversation and have felt, but have felt and seen the changes and hostility. Our most vulnerable population, BIPOC women, elderly and disabled are concerned about displacement and the curated progression of socially, economically, and culturally hostile environment that WOCAP, even with these additional recommendations, would exacerbate. We have had overwhelmingly, we have overwhelmingly found through surveys that this population wants to keep their homes, single family neighborhoods, and the unique Latinx haven that they have fought decades against adversity to develop. We need this plan to step up and provide more aggressive, sustainable protection and resources to these vulnerable demographics, their livelihood, businesses, and homes. Oak Cliff is founded upon city-led history of racism and intentional exclusion. This is a moment to learn from the past and intentionally move forward with equity, social responsibility, and social sustainability. Thank you. All right, next up is Victoria Farrell Ortiz, followed by Andrew Wallace, followed by Daniel Brown. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Victoria Farrell Ortiz. My address is 1215 Hokesmith Drive, Dallas, Texas, 75224. Um, I'm speaking today as a person who grew up in Oak Cliff and as a Ryle Planning co founder. We agree that promoting walkability is necessary to minimize pedestrian and car collisions, um, especially given what we know about infrastructure and inequality throughout the city. However, we disagree that the land use in this case is the issue. A lack of city investment in sidewalks, past planning decisions that have promoted large roadways at the expense of other forms of mobility, and a zoning code that led to these particular design standards currently in use are to blame, not autocentric shops. Um, we want a West Oak Cliff that is inclusive of its small Latinx, Hispanic owned businesses, and a West Oak Cliff that is safe for people walking and biking. And we believe both are possible and are optimistic that staff will demonstrate their commitment to both by utilizing the language that auto repair shop owners provided club members and PUD staff with. Those updates would maintain the desire to promote walkability and not threaten or target their specific land use. Through this planning process, I have seen how the same procedures are confusing and confusing. The city has an Thank you, Ms. Farrell Ortiz, that's your time. HUD. Thank you. All right, Andrew Wallace, followed by Daniel Brown, followed by Giovanni Valderas. Uh, good morning, my name is Andrew Wallace. I live at 1407 Melbourne Avenue in Elmwood. Um, I support the direction WOCAP nudges us, and I hope that it serves as a springboard to launch West Oak Cliff into the dense, resource-rich, and walkable group of neighborhoods that I know that we can be. I would invite the committee to push the envelope and expand the range where these housing typologies can be built. Our current configuration places us at just under six DUA. With the WOCAP's recommendations and restrictions, only small pockets of our neighborhoods will be able to double that, leaving the rest of us with the status quo. As Jane Jacobs said in her Death and Life of American Cities, when densities are too low, they frustrate city diversity instead of abetting it. While no one is calling for the Manhattanization of West Oak Cliff, as Jane Jacobs would with her 100 DUA recommendation, every lot, no matter what size or the proximity to transit, should allow by right quadplexes with detached ADUs. For those decrying loss of neighborhood character, that true character is made up by the people that live there, not the buildings that sit on the land. In our current state, we are a neighborhood of very little character. We are dull and unimportant, as evidenced by our lack of retail variety, restaurant variety, and sparsely placed grocery stores. And for those decrying about displacement, wouldn't it be better for five middle income families to move into a single quadplex with a detached ADU next door instead of displacing five low income families all down the block? We must think about the people who don't live here yet and not listen to the whines of the people who are trying to keep them out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Uh, Daniel Brown, followed by Giovanni Valderas, followed by Ruben Perez. Mr. Brown, whenever you're ready. I don't think we, you may be muted. No, I'm not, okay, how about now? Well, we can hear you. Okay. Please proceed. Uh, Daniel Brown, 2313 Elmwood Boulevard. Uh, I would like to basically contradict everything that the previous speaker said and add my voice to the others that have raised theirs uh, to express the concern that not only does this area plan uh, not reflect what the community wants, it actually is contrary to expressed wishes of the community. And this is evident if you look at the interactive map and the issues that were raised. 
I would also like to point out uh, was submitted to the committee today uh, a petition in Elmwood to. Mr. Brown, we're having trouble hearing you. Maybe you can try muting and unmuting. We're still having the issue, Mr. Brown. Uh, why don't we circle back around to you, maybe try logging out and logging back in, and then we'll, we'll come back to you. All right, next up, Giovanni Valderas, followed by Ruben Perez, followed by Adriana Soto Vasquez. Hold on just one second. Mr. Brown, if you, there we go. Whenever you're ready. Great, uh, I wanna thank you all for allowing us to speak. Also, I wanna thank all the working class people who showed up today to talk, to take off time from their jobs. But I think this is indicative of, of how this meeting has been run. You only allowed speakers one minute to talk and then trans thank thankfully that you are here to translate. But and I think this is how this plan has been rolled out in a sense that there's not been, has not been enough engagement in the community, which is majority Spanish speaking. I grew up in the neighborhood. I understand that we uh, have a different set of responsibilities than most kind of mobile uh, upward individuals in the community. And so it, it takes a lot of work. And I volunteered. I've I have knocked on doors to get the word out, but it still fall, this plan falls short and doesn't engage the majority of the residents who live in this neighborhood. So my recommendation is to not move this forward, but, also, but in fact, break up the plan into uh, smaller portions and then adequately engage individuals properly as they should, because our council members are always speaking about how neighborhoods have a right to self-determination, but we're not seeing that happen now. Thank you. All right, Ruben Perez, followed by Adriana Soto Vasquez, followed by Kayla Miles. I'm going to be speaking to Ruben in Spanish. In Spanish? Yes. Okay. You ready? <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> Here we go. Buenos dias. Mi nombre es Ruben Perez. Mi dirección es 810 South Windermere Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75208. Estoy aquí porque quiero hablar de WorldCap y el impacto que tendrá no solo para los negocios de automóviles, pero para toda la comunidad de Oak Cliff. Um, my, so he's speaking on behalf of Ruben Perez, uh -huh. who lives at 810 South Windermere. Um, uh, estoy, yeah. aquí para, estoy aquí porque quiero hablar de WorldCap y el impacto que tendrá no solo para los negocios de automóviles, pero to, para toda la comunidad de Oak Cliff. Um, I'm here to talk not only about the businesses that are impacted by this plan, but the entire community of Oak Cliff. Yo he vivido y todavía vivo en Oak Cliff. Desde niño caminaba, caminaba a la escuela todos los días. Um, I've lived in Oak Cliff since I've been a boy walking to school in, in the neighborhood. En muchas partes de Oak Cliff no había y ni hay ningún lugar para caminar, solo sacate o tierra. Um, in many of the areas of Oak Cliff, there's never been um, areas to walk. It's just basically been grass or, or dirt. Ahora la ciudad dice que los talleres son el problema y posiblemente causan a la gente no poder caminar. And now it's the city saying that it's auto businesses that are creating this problem and having impact on people being able to walk. Eso no es cierto. Toda la gente que yo conozco camina y nadie dice que no pueden caminar por causa de los talleres. Um, and this isn't the case. He's like, all the people, there are lots of people who walk and they're not blaming the businesses for, for this. Los talleres son esenciales y hacen un bien para la comunidad y es un lujo poder dejar tu carro en un taller favorito y ir caminando tu casa. Um, the, oh shoot, the auto businesses. The auto businesses are essential and it is a, uh, it's a luxury. It's a luxury to leave your car at a car shop and, and walk be able home. to walk home. Los talleres están en Oak Cliff por una razón. Si no, ya todos hubieran quebrado. Um, the, the businesses are in Oak Cliff for a reason. If they weren't there, they would have gone under. Uh, en la pandemia éramos esenciales y hoy todavía somos. We were essential during the pandemic and we still are. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, 
Adriana Soto Vasquez, followed by Kayla Miles. All right, Adriana Soto, 8448 Campanella Drive, grew up in 75208. We've talked about the neighborhood compatible structures via the conservational district route. We need to actively work towards that. The true concern falls under the economic development and the support for current servicing Oak Cliff businesses, such as our automotive shops. We want to include them in the plan as a priority. They are essential, as said, businesses that provide direct local services to us. It is clear that the rewarding wants to address the concern. As you are well aware, we just want to make sure that these changes provide resources for the current businesses rather than displacing them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kayla Miles. Hello, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes, we can we can hear you and see you. So whenever you're ready. I, um, I feel like the community has done a really good job of making some points I wanted to make. So I just wanted to really quickly thank the, the city for having this hearing um, and encourage them to make more public forums available for all community members, all stakeholders who want to make a prosperous plan for the future. Um, it's important to hear from the people who are already here and have made Oakland the success that it is. Um, I think two of the options you mentioned earlier were noteworthy for affordable housing options. Um, the two solutions that you mentioned that you were relying on were the TIF programs, the tax payment options, uh, such as the Davis Garden TIF, um, but you also mentioned that it's not being utilized. And even if it was being utilized, only 20% would be affordable housing. So that's not a viable solution that you're proposing. Also, the Kings Highway middle housing option that you touted as a solution is not affordable for anybody that currently lives in Oak Cliff that wants to stay here, much less for families, because those are for one bedrooms only. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Let's circle back around to see if anyone who we've missed is, is now available. Alejandro Valdez. Jorge Flores. Baltazar Montelongo. Pedro Sarmiento. I think we said Samuel Narvaez wasn't going to be here. Is that Correct. Maria Garcia. All right, and Mr. Brown, you had some technical difficulties, so why don't we give it another shot? Uh, we're still not able to hear you, Mr. Brown. Is your microphone on? Not sure. No, I, I reloaded the whole app. Okay. Um, can I write my comments out in the chat? And... Your microphone seems to be going in and out. All right. Why don't Why don't you try one more time to get it working? And in the meantime, is there anyone else here today in the building who'd like to speak um, before the committee? All right, Mr. Brown, do you have it working? Unfortunately, if you're not able to get the microphone working, they will will need to move on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. All right, let's give this one more shot, Mr. Brown. Okay. Um, so I would like to make two points. One is that um, the the uh, aspects of the area plan that reflect what is proposed for Hampton Station and Tyler Vernon Station. Um, are not, are, and I'm echoing now previous speakers, uh, they are not only, the area plan not only uh, does not reflect what the community wants, it actually is contrary to the wishes of the community. And this is apparent if you look at the issues that are raised on the uh, interactive map and the responses to them. I would also like to mention that a letter was submitted from the Elmwood Neighborhood Association uh, in support of the. All 
All right, Mr. Brown, your, your microphone's gone out again. I you want to get it working? All right, I see you shaking your head now. Uh, all right, well, that concludes our public speakers. We've been going for about an hour and a half now, so why don't we take a five minute break? We'll be back at 10.05. All right, members, are you ready to resume the meeting? If you could just turn your camera on so I know that you're there and that we have a quorum. Ms. McMahon or Mr. Houston, if you're there and can turn your camera on, I think we need one more of you to get to a quorum. Great. All right, I understand that some of the members have questions for our um, public speakers. So before we go to you, Mr. Church, for questions, let's go ahead and, and ask questions of the community members and I'll turn it over to Commissioner Carpenter first. Yes, I had a question for anyone who actually served on the steering committee. I think Ms. Barbie did, but I don't see her in the audience. Uh, and there was a Ms. Um, Ms. Yolanda Ar 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 Armada. I think Ms. Alameda is a, there we go, now she's a elevated Alameda? participant. Hi there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, am I correct you were on the um, steering committee for WOCAP? Uh, That's correct, I was on the task force representing the, uh, Martin. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you explain to me um, how we've gotten to the point where there's such a, a fundamental, it seems to be a fundamental disconnect between what the community is saying and what this final report is saying. Were these density recommendations that occur in, these, in this report, this final draft, ever presented to the steering committee or in the community outreach meetings? Um, yeah, so it was kind of taken neighborhood by neighborhood and of course a lot of deference to the neighborhood representatives on the task force. So I would say that in some neighborhoods, there was more agreement than in others. Um, you're hearing a lot from that area called South Edgefield um, neighborhood, which um, is close to my neighborhood. It was, um, it was underrepresented on the task force. And I will tell you that people have referenced a, um, a community grassroots effort to go out and talk to those hundred neighbors or so in that area. And as a result of that, um, that canvassing and a survey that, that we use as community advocates, um, the, um, what you're hearing was the overwhelming response of that area. And as a task force member most closely associated with that area, I did share that back with the task force. At one point in the discussion, um, and I will tell you that they're probably in our canvassing, as was shared, there was maybe three neighbors that we heard from that were um, open to increased density beyond, you know, even the single middle housing. Um, but the overwhelming response from the community was they only wanted a single family homes with ADUs. Now, this information was presented to city staff and to the plan commission, I mean, to the task force. Um, however, as you heard, um, one of the commenters mentioned that the city declined to take this information into account um, for a variety of reasons. And so the only two options really on the table for the task force was either option two, which was this multifamily, multifamily option, or option one, which was this missing middle housing. So, you know, of course, we went with the lower of the two options for density um, based on based on what we had available to us. But I can concur, concur and validate that specifically that area, the majority of the residents that that we spoke with and the information that we provided to the city as community advocates indicated they only wanted, uh, they only wanted single family homes and ADUs. 
I can I can speak less to the area around um, Hampton Station. I know there's a lot of concern in Elmwood about what the impact of a three or four story um, apartment home would do to their area. All right, thank you. Um, may I continue? Absolutely. Okay, yes. Um, moving on to the subject of um, auto-centric businesses. Um, to the best of your recollection, what was the, uh, the steering committee's vision for automotive businesses? Were, were there any expressions of um, desires to reduce the number of current automotive businesses, or did they wish to maintain mm -hmm. the current automotive businesses? If you could just um, elaborate on what you believe the steering committee's um, tone was about those businesses. Sure, for, you know, just from my perspective of uh, participation, I think the more we began to discuss, um, again, you know, a lot of this is couched in walkability. And so, you know, when you ask a, a neighbor or you ask a person, do you want a walkable neighborhood? Um, the overwhelming response is yes. But as you start to understand that that means that perhaps a business will lose its livelihood because it doesn't meet the definition of walkability as related to curb cuts. As people started to understand that, they became more um, empathetic to the cause of the auto-centric businesses, and they shared that that wasn't their intent. And I tried to share in my comments that if you look at our community vision, it's 100% in support of small business, especially those that are women-owned, minority-owned, et cetera. So I think that's why you'll see that in every neighborhood other than Elmwood, the, the um, the recommendations was changed to take out the term autocentric businesses and just talk about curb cuts, hoping that then during the authorized hearing process, this can come under further um, author for further commentary and further advisement. But um, but again, Elmwood still specifically does um, recommend the um, reduction or, or elimination of autocentric businesses as a recommendation. But again, even in talking in our task force meetings that you know it wasn't that there was this direct understand understanding that doing away with autocentric businesses results in walkability or vice versa so i know elmwood actually consider uh, requested putting in some language to recommend against amateurization for that reason because it was too late to go back to the community at that point we were already looking at the final draft Uh, to the best of your knowledge, has the um, have the recommendations in the final draft been presented to the community and community meetings? Uh, yeah, there was a sixty day period from, um, and Daniel can help with the date. But there was a sixty day period where there was a um, there were uh, there were I believe two initial city meetings to present the draft, um, which again you know, I didn't feel like enough to me. I know that the city did two pop-ups that they talked about going to to a, a couple of grocery stores. I will tell you that we as community advocates and neighborhood associations held a, a, numerous meetings to try to inform our neighborhoods and the city did attend. All right, thank you very much. Members, additional questions for any of our public speakers? All right, questions for Mr. Church or other members of city staff? Commissioner Carpenter. Mr. Church, um, we've heard pretty consistently from the speakers and um, throughout the process that the neighborhood's strong preference is to maintain its single family character. And, um, you know, my understanding of their recommendations is they were willing to accept um, ADUs and possibly limited duplexes and in some certain targeted locations such as the Hampton Station and some peripheral parcels, they were uh, willing to consider, you know, upzoning. But the recommendations that we have today for, um, you know, density seem to focus very heavily on, I think in your um, presentation, the reducing barriers to new supply but the uh, preventing gentrification displacement seems to have gotten lost a little bit. Um, wh what happened to 
the neighbor's strong desire for a single family neighborhood when it became time to um, incorporate density uh, recommendations in the draft. Sure, so you know, when we're, when we're thinking about any station area, you know, one of the main things that we have to do through any area planning process is not only think about, it's, it's obviously highly important to consider the neighborhood's concern, but we also have to think about citywide issues, citywide adopted policies. The number one driving factor that we have related to transit-oriented development citywide is a recommendation in our climate action plan which calls for a dramatic change in land uses around transit stations to reduce trips that are generated by single occupancy vehicles. So that calls for a reduction from 89 to 62 percent of all commuting trips by 2040. And that plan, the climate action plan, specifically speaks to, you know, increasing density around transit stations. Having that as a starting point and knowing that we've got a desire from city adopted policy to increase density around all transit stations that is obviously in direct conflict with the community's desire to see no change. Mm -hmm. That's where the recommendation was very targeted towards locations that are, you know, allowing accessory dwelling units and duplexes, which would marginally increase density since we know that anything that would occur on those lots would be incremental. Um, it would not be a, a whole scale change. And through the recommendations for design guidance, you know, we, we actually did a driving tour with our task force of examples of conservation districts and other areas in Dallas that have well-designed missing middle housing and explained how zoning tools could be used to have a quadplex sit next to a single family home and not feel any different. And there was consensus amongst the task force members that were on that tour that, yeah, this feels like a single family neighborhood that's comfortable to be in. Um, you know, it's not a dramatic change. That, that's one factor. The other factor related to affordability. Um, we know that different price point, that if, if the single family neighborhood zoning is all that is, ever exists in West Oak Cliff, in 25 years, this area is gonna be a million dollar valued properties like Lakewood, um, and that there won't be any price points for current residents. So we went through a, a kind of a process where we talked about the construction cost and land values of existing properties and what different price points would look like to say how much a, an ADU's rent could be because you got to build it and rent it out or what a duplex mortgage might look like and things like that. And again, obviously this is a little bit of a back of the envelope calculations, but the whole point was providing more housing choice instead of just single family homes was something that could put money in pockets for existing homeowners because they could decide to turn their house into a duplex, um, but it could also provide additional housing choice types for families that maybe they only want a two bedroom unit because it's all they can afford, it's all they desire, and none of those options currently exist in West Oak Cliff. And so it really was trying to balance city adopted policy with affordability goals, with the desire to maintain the existing character, and that's how we came to the recommendations about allowing some of this additional housing type, the you know quadplexes and again, only 1% of total lots in these areas, um, but still maintaining uh, design standards to have it look and feel like the, the existing neighborhood fabric. Were there um, community meetings um, that went into great detail as to, you know, the, the uh, I guess the disconnect between what the neighborhood's desire is to maintain their single family homes and what, I mean, I understand completely that you were between a rock and a hard place between what the neighborhood's clearly expressed desires were and what the, the city council's adopted policies are. I, I do understand that. But um, I'm not sensing from the community that there has been um, a robust, you know, expression of, of what the issues are. Has this final draft that incorporated the these missing middle housing and affordability issues, I mean, had, had those uh, meetings occurred? Because I'm not getting the sense from this audience that they have. So the recommendations for missing middle housing were included in the draft that was released to the public in March. Mm -hmm. For that draft, we had two public meetings. One was virtual, one was in person. We had 60 people attend the virtual and 100 people attend the meeting in person. We also, as, as uh, Ms. Alameda mentioned, we also had 
meetings that were organized by each neighborhood association in West Oak Cliff, where myself and other staff went and presented a detailed, you know, 30 to 40 slide presentation just about the recommendations and what it would mean for their neighborhood specifically. So we had seven of those meetings. We had two pop-up events where we uh, were at local grocery stores where we answered questions and, and educated. Um, so, you know, that, that was a total of nine meetings over the course of a 60-day period. Um, so, you know, that was, that was the, the engagement process that we did with the final draft um, where we did present information about the recommendations about missing middle housing. So, so that information was shared with the public through multiple different meetings. Was enough weight given to the fact that this is, uh, I don't remember what the exact percentage is, but these, for the most part, this area is very, uh, the demographics skew very heavily Hispanic. And I believe, I, I think it was well in the 80 percentile range. And that the um, households that live here currently are, uh, you know, drive, they commute by car. They aren't using mass transit to get to work um, for whatever reasons, because they just don't work for the, their jobs or, or their family responsibilities or whatever. You know, so what I'm hearing here is that the only way to maintain affordability going forward is to completely change the character of the neighborhood and perhaps attract residents that don't reflect the, um, the character and the demographic that the, the community is interested in protecting. Yeah, you know, I mean, I would, we know that the, the housing market is obviously driving land values and, and price values on properties in all of West Oak Cliff, but in the Elmwood area specifically and in the areas around transit specifically, uh, uh, it's, it's, they've dramatically increased. So that change is happening regardless. Um, what, you know, what we also know is that um, this, this change will occur and continue to occur with or without a plan. Mm -hmm. um, the desire is not for there to be a, a, whole, a wholesale change of neighborhood character. And I think that there's two different neighborhood characters to talk about. There's the neighborhood demographics and, and the cultural character, and then there's the land use built form character. From the built form character, you know, we feel confident that the design guidelines that, again, are just a starting point for some sort of future zoning change in these areas are, are, are adequate to allow for areas to feel the exact same way that they do today um, in terms of uh, the size and scale of homes. It's just simply allowing a house that is 2,000 square feet to have two units in it instead of one. From a cultural perspective, that's not something that we can regulate through zoning. And so that's something that we obviously, you know, the, the main way that we can, we can work to ensure that there's um, cultural consistency and that the culture will, remains in these areas is to keep the existing community in their homes. And so that's where the entire list of strategies that we have outlined in, uh, in the section about affordability, about um, expanding our, our home improvement loan program, creating the neighborhood empowerment zone, all of those strategies are intended to allow existing homeowners to remain in place, knowing that if those programs don't exist and if the existing single family zoning remains unchanged, We've already seen examples in the Elmwood area and other places where old bungalows are being torn down and there's million or half million dollar McMansions that have been built. That's the future that is, is set up for this neighborhood without some sort of protection through zoning that, again, allows some of that additional density and additional and changes of price point, whereas at the same time ensures that the, the design of those structures fits in with what already is there. Moving on to a, a related issue, um, as I was listening to what your, um, your new presentation had to say about platting, uh, you know, Mike, after sitting on the you know, plan commission for four and a half years now, you know, we, we look at platting cases every week. And when we're presented with plats to consider, we're not allowed to you know, go out and look at the area. We don't read the zoning. We don't talk to anyone. We're, we're simply confronted with a piece of paper that shows us the outlines of the lots. Now, if you are allowing, let, let's, let's say the, the, what are they called, the narrow lot homes, and all of a sudden you can split a 60-foot lot into two 30-foot lots, and we're presented with pieces, and that's, that starts happening. And then what's to stop some, a builder, say, from buying three 50-foot lots and replatting it into five 30-foot lots if this kind of building um, pattern is allowed? I mean, I see in your recommendations that you don't want to allow 
platting for bigger lots in excess of 25 percent of you know the average on the block and of course I have a question about that also is how do you incorporate uh, non-residential parcels institutional parcels such as schools and churches and that sort of thing from skewing the average on a particular block so uh, I'll just I'll, I'll get to there and just say, have you have you given that any consideration as to what's going to happen with that that that's a great point you know in terms of lot size being smaller that that's not something that we had considered because I think the concern expressed from the community was platting to make larger properties in terms mm -hmm. of smaller properties you know, I, I think that the, the thought was that it likely wouldn't be replatted into two lots. It would just be a single lot that's essentially a duplex split. Um, that's, that, you know, that's something we missed. That's a good point. That's something that we can add into that recommended additional bullet that talks about max lot si max and minimum lot size or something about mm -hmm. no larger than or no smaller than so that we ensure that there's um, consistency on both sides of the spectrum. I know that came up when we were looking at the bottoms. And so I think that's something, but, but just the, and my other question about platting is, you know, you're saying that these changes ought to occur within so many feet of a high frequency bus route or a, a transit oriented development. I mean, how, that, that would never show up on a plat map. You, you know, how would we distinguish between what, you know, you have a radius, but when we're looking at a, you know, a, a piece of paper that shows all the lots in the area and areas defined very loosely as a neighborhood. I, I'm just not understanding how this, that arbitrary um, boundary limit would then protect the neighborhood, the, the lots on the outside of it from being affected by this change in the pattern of the area. Because that's what, that's what 8.503 tells us to look at, is the pattern of the area. And, you know, pattern and area are, both have some sub subjectivity, but if you start seeing, you know, a map that shows lots split in half or aggregated or whatever, I think subdivision will come back with recommendations, say there's no pattern of the area, and then it would be, you know, the Oklahoma land rush. Because if you can put more density of any sort, whether it's two smaller houses on, you know, si you know two $500,000 houses as opposed to one $300,000 house, I, I just see that this, and, and once again, it's not that I don't understand where, where you're coming from with, with what the city's policies are, but I'm try, what I'm trying to figure out is how this is going to work with the, the neighbor's overwhelming desire to protect the character of their neighborhood and that we don't inadvertently do something that displaces people. Yeah, no, that's an excellent um, point. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just need to let the audience know that if you're going to be exiting to go to the restrooms or leave the meeting, the doors on the top are unlocked. Please use those doors instead of uh, coming down this way. Thank you very much. I mean, do you know of a way through zoning to address that? Because I don't. Zoning can absolutely define max lot size or minimum lot size. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously R75 zoning does that, but you know, that was, that was initially where the recommendation in some of these areas like Elmwood, we know there's a desire for there to be a conservation district, and we have conservation districts that already define lot size. And so that infill residential zoning category or an overlay tool or a conservation district, and we are leaving it open-ended since this doesn't change zoning, it's just a starting point for exploring an authorized hearing, all three of those could incorporate language about lot size into them, into the, into the zoning code. That obviously lot size is different than platting. Mm -hmm. Platting is a process, lot size would be something that the, z that the zoning would determine. Um, so I, it would make sense for this to be codified in the zoning and not rely on 8.503 to do that. All right, but, but you know, in platting, once again, what we're looking at is 8.503. You know, we're not allowed to do any sort of investigation or anything like that. So. I, I just have, cannot work through that mechanism in my mind. But um, I have more questions. Do I continue or let's? Uh, by all means, continue. All right. Moving on to auto, auto businesses. I know in your, um, your presentation today, your amended presentation, you, are, um, you stated that uh, some of the language is going to be changed that specifically removes the references to auto-related businesses. What references to auto related auto-related businesses remain in the document? Are they singled out at all anywhere? There's only one area in, of all the, you know, we have seven focus areas. I think initially in the March draft, there would have been four areas that there was recommendations. Maybe, 
So downtown Elmwood is the only one that remains that has a recommendation that specifically calls out auto-centric businesses, and that was at the request of the Elmwood Neighborhood Association and their representative on the task force. At the same time, that's something that, again, can be amended uh, to be in alignment with the other areas, but we left it in there based on what we heard after the 60-day comment period from the Elmwood Neighborhood Association and the representative. Okay, I just want to be very clear. Did those recommendations um, want um, current auto businesses to be made non-conforming and therefore subject to amortization, or was it a specific request to not have new auto businesses? Well, so we specifically do have language in the in the plan for that section that says it is not the desire for there to be amateurization on those properties. If if a use becomes non-conforming, that can occur regardless. Right. At the same time. Um, that was not the explicit desire of the neighborhood association. The main desire of the neighborhood association was no new uses, um, which does create its own legal challenges to allow existing uses to remain conforming, but new uses to, of the same use type to become non-conforming. Mm -hmm. um, that presents just legal challenges. And so, you know, the specifics of that would need to be further determined by our city attorney's office. The only other area where we're specifically recommending any sort of specific uh, wording about any sort of auto-centric uses is on West Davis and PD 631. Mm -hmm. There are two sub areas that are, because um, there's a lot of different sub areas in the stretch between Hampton and Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. There are two sub areas that currently permit gas stations and car washes on very small lots that directly back up to single family. Mm -hmm. There's none of those uses there today, but the surrounding neighborhoods are concerned that that could happen in the future. And so they were, they desired to see the zoning changed in the future to prevent that. Okay, but I think a lot of the people here today are in the Hampton Clarendon area. So um, to, address, to try to attempt to uh, address their concerns, um, what you're saying is, all specific references to auto-related businesses are being removed from that section of the draft. Is that correct? That is correct. Based on the, the wording that we was presented today, um, you know, based on the conversation and, and support from this committee, um, we, we will amend the draft to change the recommendation for item 1C, as well as other recommendations. There's one for the Tyler Vernon area, and then there's one for Hampton Station area that have the same language, mm -hmm. we will we'll change those languages as well. Okay, and does the uh, design language on walkability have some uh, mechanism, sort of a backdoor assault on these current businesses? There should be none that I know of. It, again, this is uh, this would only be for new construction. It would not be retroactively applied to existing structures. All right, so your understanding of, well, your, your statement that the way the draft exists now and the way it is going to be amended poses no threat to the ongoing um, operations of these auto-related businesses in that area. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Members, additional questions for city staff? Commissioner Popkin. Good morning. I know I'm not a, an official member of this committee, but thank you so much for allowing me to um, continue the questioning of staff. Um, this is my neighborhood. This is my district. And I've been listening closely to all of the conversations and I'm, I'm deeply disturbed that there are so many residents here um, still wondering and um, feeling like this plan is um, going to impact their livelihood on a daily basis. It does appear, thank you, Commissioner Carpenter, for your questions. Those were a lot of my questions and concerns as well. Um, I, I do have a somewhat um, unrelated question to this plan, but um, Daniel, I'm wondering if you can help understand what can be done to help existing businesses stay in the neighborhood. I know outside of zoning specifically, um, one of the biggest concerns for these businesses is likely that code compliance um, will become the reason why uh, their, their business can no longer stay um, due to uh, consistent um, calls to code compliance. I know I've, I've heard this happening to existing businesses and um, piling up of tickets and not knowing 
you know, what exactly can be done in those situations, what resources are available for existing business owners if, you know, if they start being badgered about code compliance issues? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, obviously, th this plan um, is not uh, any sort of directional guide for our code compliance department. Um, you know, they, they're simply enforcing the code that exists. So the main thing that we can do through this plan is ensure that the code is not changed in a way that would further or exacerbate um, existing problems. Um, that said, you know, the plan does have some strategies related to small businesses generally. Um, one of those is a, a specific recommendation for there to be a West Oak Cliff business coalition or task force that's created to have a steering committee that works with our building inspections department, have maybe potentially have representatives from co-compliance on there um, to work with the city to um, identify problems and work through issues so that those kind of problems don't occur at the same time um, also being able to work with the local chambers of commerces, whether it's the Oak Cliff Chamber of Commerce or um, any other chambers of commerces in Dallas um, to, to promote their businesses as well. We also have recommendations in the plan. We now have a small business center through our, uh, that used to be part of the Office of Economic Development. Now they're their own department. Um, so we have recommendations to um, leverage a lot of their different grant sources and tools uh, to help support small businesses, whether it's facade improvements or small loans to help businesses um, continue to improve. Um, but in terms of code enforcement specifically, um, you know, we, we uh, is, as long as the code is, the, we're not making any recommendations for the code to be changed in terms of how a use might be, um, you know, have trash on a site or anything like that. And I understand that those are calls that uh, can occur um, those can occur today, they could occur in the future. Um, you know, I, I would have to speak more with code compliance to understand what mechanisms or tools there might be to, to prevent that from occurring. Um, but you know, obviously the goal of all of those is, is for businesses to be good neighbors to surrounding neighborhoods, um, as well as neighbors being good neighbors to surrounding neighbors. That's really helpful. Um, what would you say is the next step in creating this West Oak Cliff Task Force that you spoke of? recommending in the plan? Yeah, well, you know, I think something that's been really uh, a, a positive that's come out of the, the West Oak Cliff area planning effort has simply been the, the grassroots um, coalescing of, of communities uh, to, to work with one another and, and to, um, you know, kind of have a, a, a shared message and a shared vision, you know, something that um, would be a next step would be to use the task force that already exists for, for this area plan maybe as a starting point. But I think that a lot of the business owners that we heard speak today, as well as others, um, would be, it, you know, we'd welcome having them work with our small business center here at City Hall to, to think through a strategy to, to get a coalition created. Um, we, we've got resources in that department to help with that um, outside of this area planning process. So it sounds like the next step might be for the WOCAP task force to convene a meeting with concerned businesses, um, especially auto-oriented businesses, to hold the meeting in Spanish and to include code compliance and the small business team in that meeting to decipher what the next steps need to be and to get business owners in touch with the right resources at City Hall so when there is an issue they know who to call. Sound accurate? Yeah, that, that's accurate. That, that would be a, a, a great next step. Yeah, that sounds like one of the primary concerns and I can definitely see that playing out in an unfavorable way if it's not something that we get on top of immediately. Um, my other concern is about, um, there was uh, multiple references to the curb cut. Um, what, what's your take on the conversation? Why is this an issue and what is, what, what, how does the plan address this? I know this was a conversation the last time we talked about this plan as well. Yeah, so in, in the way that the recommendation on the wording has been, uh, the, the recommended wording change, um, you know, that specifically just says that the design of the public realm is important. Um, for Clarendon specifically, that's a street that in the area plan, we were making recommendations for 
not only uh, bike facilities to be included in our bike plan, but also reconstruction of the public realm there. Because what we know is there are segments of that area in that commercial district that don't even have sidewalk. And so that would be a capital project. An example similar to, to that in terms of scale uh, that occurred recently was on Henderson um, in East Dallas. That was reconstructed. And the way that our public works department works with um, or you know, implements projects to rebuild sidewalks is working property owner by property owner to identify their needs and uh, while also ensuring that it's still meeting our engineering standards. So maybe it's, you know, realizing that two curb cuts aren't needed when you could just have one, reducing the width of, of curb cuts, things like that. The recommendation and the wording that's in there is really geared towards new construction. So if uh, a, a, an existing building or a vacant lot were to be developed upon, um, ensuring that the driveways for that is narrow and ensuring that the building placement for that is near the street um, and activating the street and screening parking so that it does create that, that more, more of an urban edge and, and walkable experience. Um, but none of those would be, none of those standards would be retroactively applied to existing structures. So when the city begins the process of building sidewalks, are they also looking at curb cuts? Is that what you said? So anything that's in the city right of way um, would be considered to be redesigned. Um, so if, you know, we've got examples where in other areas where we've got head in parking and a project's come in and reconstructed a street, the, the city works with those property owners to come up with a solution that works for them, but also still meets the goals of the project. So the same thing would occur here. That's all done through an extensive community engagement effort as well through our transportation department, um, through, you know, or through our bond office. Um, so the specifics obviously would need to be worked out in the future if that project were to get funded, because currently there's no funding for the, for any sort of reconstruction of Clarendon. Um, the goal would be to, the goal is always to allow businesses to continue to operate um, while, while working to also include and maximize the goals of a project. And if the goal of a project is to reconstruct a street to make it safer and walkable, then, you know, finding solutions um, will be part of that. Thank you. And I know currently we're looking at reconstructing um, West Davis from Rosemont down west, almost to Westmoreland, I believe, um, if not past Westmoreland. Um, and, and so you're saying in a, in a project such as that, the process of design um, comes down to staff working with property owners who make determinations of what needs to change. Is that the process? That is correct. So I know specifically on West Davis, for example, we've, we've definitely got a lot of small businesses that have head in parking that half the parking space is in city right of way, half the parking space is on private property. And so that, and a lot of those businesses have Delta credits and, and other parking mechanisms that allow their business to continue to operate. Um, even though some of that parking is in the public right of way, um, keeping all of that, uh, at, you know, that that's obviously important to, to maintain that parking while also working to deliver the project. So on that project specifically, I know that that, that project's sort of been on hold and there hasn't been engagement for about the last year. Um, but the, our transportation department and public works department will continue to work as design on that project moves forward. They would work with property owners adjacent to the street um, to ensure that anything that they're proposing and designing um, still works with and helps those businesses continue to function and operate just as they have been. Okay, great. And I know when that continues, we'll also need to focus on um, Spanish language engagement since a lot of those building owners, property owners, and business owners are Spanish speaking primarily. Um, that's going to be huge. But back to the curb cuts issue. So if we begin to focus on the Clarendon Hampton area and are looking at, you know, sidewalk enhancements that may also include curb cut changes, who makes the determination that curb cuts may or may not be necessary for a business? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I, I, I can't think of any examples in our zoning code that where the zoning regulates how many curb cuts a business has. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, 
typically done if it's a capital project that's typically done through you know a uh, negotiation between the city and the property owner um, through a zoning change you know we we wouldn't we we wouldn't put language in in zoning that says it can only be one curb cut or anything like that um, but you know something that could be included would be um, the max width of curb cuts or the max uh, you know example in our form based districts we've got a maximum frontage of a property up against the right of way that has to have a building edge there and so maybe that 70 percent of a of the of the platted lot adjacent to a right of way would have to have a structure there that would only leave the other 30 percent for a curb cut and parking so i'm not saying that that's the specific recommendation here but that would again that would only be for new development um, and that would be determined through the authorized hearing process so that's the only circumstance under which you're saying um, zoning would impact the number of curb cuts and that would only impact new construction because existing buildings aren't going to be required to make those types of changes. They'll be grandfathered in the way they are. That's correct. Okay. Um, I think that answers all of my questions right now. Um, I have similar concerns as Commissioner Carpenter with the, the ability to separate lots into more lots. I know there's a clause in the plan that there's um, not an intent to allow more units when properties are replatted. So that, that perhaps might cover it, but I know that you know the area plan, for example, isn't something that uh, planning commission or um, our city attorneys are referencing when we're when we're doing um, subdivision uh, replats. So that that's a bit of a concern. Um, and I, I hear what you're saying, Daniel. Like a lot of these forces that people are most concerned about are things that are happening across the country and neighborhoods just like ours. And it's not that this plan is necessarily going to, you know, hopefully not create more problems and make things worse. We're, we're hoping to, you know, keep, keep ourselves from creating more issues with this. But I, I hear we're trying to be creative and think outside the box on what we can put in the plan to continue the stability of this neighborhood in the form that it has existed for so many decades and that you know so many people are just fine with the neighborhood the way it is but we've got forces market forces out of our control and you know people looking to um, redevelop our neighborhood in ways that we can't even fathom um, and all we can try to do is learn from what we've seen happen in other parts of our neighborhood and just continue um, doing the best we can as zoning cases uh, come to us, but I think it sounds like the work that your team has done, it has, from my perspective, addressed a lot of the concerns for missing middle um, and, and auto-oriented businesses to the, the hot, hottest topic issues here. Um, and I, I applaud your efforts. I know this has been extremely difficult and one of the most complicated area plans that we've done here in the city of Dallas, and you guys have really stepped up and done much more than you have in the past. Um, that concludes my qu questions for now. Thank you so much for your time on this. Members, additional questions for city staff. Mr. Hawkins, it looks like we're you're just trying to speak. I just can't, I can't hear you. Looks like you still may be muted. Perhaps try muting, unmuting. We, we still unfortunately can't hear you. Uh, maybe, what about now? Wait, 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 there you go. All right. You found the magic button. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, and thank you, city staff. I have a, a question about um, page five of your uh, uh, PDF, PDF uh, presentation document. You said notable. Uh, draft plans changes since uh, 614 was number one amendments to the history section, uh, but you didn't um, have an opportunity to share that. Is that is that possible for you all to share that? 
Uh, yeah, we can share that. I can I can share the specific language um, with uh, with Brian and Lawrence to share with you after the meeting. What we okay. did add was uh, we we amended the timeline as 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 suggested by this committee, and we also uh, amended the language in reference to William Hoard, um, and the we changed the language about because uh, I think it had initially been um, uh, it was I think we had it as enslaved. Africans and we changed it to the African people he enslaved. So we changed that phrase as well. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, the other question is really just uh, the biggest concern from the speakers. Uh, does that change in the language around uh, auto centric cars address what uh, folks are saying today? Um, I, I know that they weren't responding necessarily to your presentation. They were responding to the previous uh, WOCAP plan. But does that change address the concerns that they've spoken to today? The current language as as proposed uh, with if you know that again, that's a starting point for the for the authorized hearing. Yeah. So the specifics would be determined through the authorized hearing, but the current language as proposed uh, would have no impacts on existing property owners or existing businesses in the Hampton Clarendon area. Okay. Uh, I think my last question is really about uh, kind of in, uh, potential enforcement, and I know this is probably not in your peer, uh, like your um, responsibility, but I'm interested in, in how, um, you know, city staff um, outside of your, um, your department will uh, interpret this, particularly like code enforcement, who will be enforcing, uh, you know, walkability or potential, uh, you know, things in this area. and, and and my, my question is, um, how does this um, involve code enforcement who will be potentially uh, thinking about um, you know, violations to the zoning ordinances? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, throughout this process, when we've heard various complaints uh, about specific properties or other concerns, we've relayed those on to code enforcement so that they were aware um, whether it was you know, Ill illegal dumping and things of that nature. Moving forward, you know, in terms of the way that zoning code is interpreted for like a new construction, that would be something that obviously has to get go through our building inspection office when a when a property is is seeking a construction permit. Um, I I don't know the specific answer, um, and I can get back to you on you know how code enforcement would work on. You know, ensure or working with existing property owners, but again, it wouldn't be retroactively applied. The zoning change and the language that's in there wouldn't be retroactively applied to existing structures. Um, so it should only be applied from the perspective of a new property coming through to get a building permit um, and get constructed. Thank you for that. I, I asked that question uh, very specifically because the speaker mentioned that um, you know the city hadn't been out to look at a property for six plus years or something like that and so I was really interested in, in what this plan does to address that type of issue um, particularly if communities aren't getting city services uh, themselves yeah so this this area plan is obviously land use focused and uh, while we've obviously passed along concerns to code compliance and sanitation and other concerns, they have their own strategic plans that this plan doesn't speak to and, and you know, can't inform. Um, but at the same time, we have, through the engagement process, from what we've heard, passed along that information to those departments so that they can identify problem properties or, or other issues that might be there um, and work to fix them. Um, you know, an example has been... Uh, Things such as street lights being out, you know, those are those are things that traditionally the best way to inform would be going through 311. And while we've obviously told the community, you know, that, that we encourage you to do that, we've still passed on on our end as well those kinds of complaints and reports so that those projects and um, services are improved as soon as possible. Yeah, you know, I'm just. My, my last, last thing is I'm really interested in how we can do a better job of connecting um, that to uh, like city services, because it seems like these things work in concert, but you making uh, or, the, or your department making suggestions to uh, code enforcement uh, doesn't seem like it works well uh, 
And I'm also, you know, thinking about now the new racial equity plan, which will be developed and how that will work in concert with this is too. So um, thank you for that. And I really just think uh, we have to find ways in the, in this plan to suggest because that's, I, get, I guess that's our responsibility that these plans should work together and not separate. Yeah, one specific thing that we did do, and this only relates to parks, and this has to do with how our parks department is managed and parks board. We do have a uh, a fund that is now generated. Um, I'm not going to get the the exact word right, but um, it's essentially a you know when a new development is constructed, a park dedication fund that a fee that that a park dedication fee that a new development would pay into. Um, the way that that code is written, that has to stay within a park service district. And I think that there's six or seven park service districts in all of Dallas. So our recommendation is that um, does we do have a recommendation in there about trying to use fees that are generated in West Oak Cliff to stay specifically in West Oak Cliff or directly adjacent so that the so that the benefits of that money can benefit uh, property owners in the area and you know residents in the area. Um, you know, that's one example. I, you know, I think that the other, the other sanitation and code, those are all funded through our general fund. So it's, uh, it would require citywide changes to code to initiate those kinds of localized implementation of funds. Um, but generally, um, you know, I think that there's opportunities long term to think about that that probably can't be handled specifically through this plan. Thank you. Commissioner Carpenter. Yes, I think this is my final question or comment, but I have a concern as to how this area plan, if adopted, would inform future zoning cases. Because right now it reads as a, you know, a ringing endorsement of zoning and adding missing middle housing, which um, what, what I've been hearing is, is not what the neighborhoods have been saying. It's what, it's what the staff's uh, um, synthesis of the neighborhood's concern plus um, the recently adopted council policies on transitory development densities and that sort of thing. Would it be um, more clear or could this um, area plan be more clear as to what the actual recommendations are here, you know, how the how these came about? Because right now, you know, a future plan commission or council could read this report and go, well, you know, the neighborhoods were all on board with these density recommendations, and we're, we're hearing very consistently that that is not the case. So um, I personally would be more comfortable if, if that was a little uh, clearer, that uh, the only way, the only way I'm seeing um, from the report and from, you know, my knowledge of how zoning works here in the city is that for neighborhoods to protect their single family character, it's going to be a neighborhood by neighborhood adoption of a conservation district that has fairly specific design guidelines that limit things like lot coverage and um, height and rooftops and, and that sort of thing. Because, you know, right now I think it, it gives a false impression and I'm not comfortable with that. So the area plan informs zoning changes in two different ways. Specifically in terms of we've got the current seven or five authorized hearings that are already on the docket and in the queue, this has recommendations for each of the focus areas that specifically speak to the general vision. That serves as a starting point. So if this plan is adopted, city staff and our department will begin processing those authorized hearings using the plan as a guide to move those five forward. So there are those five um, which would move forward in, in the following months. Then there are recommendations that specifically speak to changes, a recommend, it, and the way we have it worded is um, a recommendation to consider zoning changes, which would be through an authorized hearing to certain areas. So that would be changes to West Davis. Uh, that would require an authorized hearing to be filed because uh, that would, you know, it's, it's a PD change. Or to some of this missing middle housing, that can only occur by city staff through a uh, you know, council or CPC making the motion to create an authorized hearing for those areas. Same with the conservation district. Conservation district is, is no different. It's, you know, a, a community led process, but all of these processes would require a full public process for each one of those authorized hearings to occur. The other way that it informs land use changes or zoning changes 
is the future land use map, which is on page 50 of the document. Um, that has the five different place types, which that future land use map, again, is just a puzzle piece that will fit into the future land use map for Forward Dallas. That has five different category or five different place type categories, which are residential neighborhood, uh, urban, urban residential, commercial center and corridor, neighborhood mixed use, and open space. And so while within those place types, there are a pretty wide variety of zonings, and we know that, I, I know that there was concern from some folks in the community that we say in the commercial center and corridor that that might include multifamily. That's different than the zoning that's on the ground, and so it's not to say that it could never be multifamily, but there are areas, there are commercial corridor areas today that exist in, in places of the city that have multifamily directly adjacent to commercial shopping centers. And so that's how that place type gets created. Um, that serves as a guide for city plan, for staff, city plan commission and council to look at the map on a parcel specific level and say, you know, this is, zone, or this is identified in the area plan as residential neighborhood and somebody wants to build commercial here. That is not in alignment with the area plan. We would recommend denial. Um, you know, that's, that's how the future land use map is intended to be used to, to help guide and, and steer planning decisions or zoning decisions. But again, all of those are also public processes where the public has a, a forum to express their concerns as well. Yes, thank you. That, that, my concern remains that this area plan as presented presents recommendations that to my mind are largely staff driven and do not fully incorporate neighborhoods desires. Now I understand, you know, where you're coming from, but should there be a clearer explanation of, of how these recommendations came about that? Because right now, you know, if, if I didn't know anything about it and I sat down and read this document, I would think, oh, well, everyone's on board. And, and from what we hear, everyone is clearly not on board. So, and since the, the adopted area plan would inform you know, future, everything that you just talked about, you know, with people who were not involved in this process, how do we make this clear for those, you know, future decisions? I think that this, then, that is an opportunity for you to provide that comment to, for us to move that forward to CPC for further discussion for inclusion. So what we want to get from this meeting is comments from you all that you think that may not currently be in the plan um, and precisely that if you think that we should forward that comment on to CPC that something additional needs to be added into the plan we can absolutely do that as part of this process and then it can be further discussed at CPC thank you one follow-up question on Commissioner Carpenter's question um, I don't know if this is for Mr. Church or for Ms. Gillis are there existing area plans right now in the city, for example, did the Southwest Dallas area plan that note when there are differences of opinion on particular issues that are presented in those area plans? So those are in process and generally no. So what happens through that is um, it, it really develops through the staff report process and then as it goes along, we can certainly, in sort of a background or introduction, provide that information of context of how we got to the recommendations that we got to. Um, but generally speaking, I should say for existing plans, we don't, because they're still in progress, we don't have um, that information or language currently in the plans. Okay, that, that runs counter to what I've seen in a couple of area plans, but they're older. But all right. Yeah, they're older plans, but it was certainly as part of, like I said, the background or the introduction, we can provide that of, you know, this is the input that we heard, this is the process that we heard, or, you know, the, the information that we heard throughout the process, and this is how we came to this conclusion. So that can certainly be added into if, if that's the will of the body. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, one follow-up. So is this the first area plan that will have been drafted after council has adopted the um, resolutions about traffic uh, transit-oriented development and adding more density? That is correct. It's also the first area plan adopted after the change and in, in, in the process for how authorized hearings are processed. 
members additional questions for staff Ms. Nightingale. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and I just uh, want to thank the speakers for coming down and for taking the time out of your days. Your time is very valuable and a lot of you have come twice now to speak to us and, um, you know, we definitely appreciate that. Uh, just one comment, you know, Daniel and team, I know that you have put um, so much time into this and have done um, a lot of work with this plan and I appreciate that. Um, just one comment from last time that I'd like to reiterate is I know that there's not a plan in place for reviewing these um, once they've been implemented and would like to, you know, send on for consideration by CPC that, you know, perhaps that is something that we start to consider after a plan is adopted in X amount of time that we take a look at it and um, look at what the impact has been. Of course, I understand that takes resources and um, there's a lot that goes into that. But I do think saying that this is it and no other changes moving forward is a bit intense. And um, I do think every every plan should be living, breathing, and able to be uh, adjusted in the future. So thank you. And just a little plug on that, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think we definitely need to, and that's part of why in our plans we're putting in implementation matrices as well. So it, it, it's very easy for us to, on a yearly basis, go through and see what the status is of all of the recommendations and to be able to do the analysis of what's working, what might, what might not be working, because these aren't finite plans. They can be updated. Um, after a certain period of time as well as we're seeing different change or not change. So it's a really helpful point and that's something that we want to, you know, implement moving forward and making sure that we're doing those check-ins. So thank you. Members, additional questions? All right, seeing none, I'm going to pass the chair off to Commissioner Carpenter so I can make a motion. Yes, Mr. Rubin, I'm willing to consider a motion. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Carpenter. Um, this motion is going to be long, so please bear with me as I work through it and try to decipher my own chicken scratch. So I move that we recommend um, endorsement of the West Oak Cliff area plan of the final draft shared with the comp plan committee to, in advancing it to the city plan commission subject to um, the changes made by staff um, after our 614 meeting as referenced on page five of Mr. Church's um, presentation today. Um, the second item would be to follow staff's language on page 23 of Mr. Church's um, presentation regarding the autocentric uses, changing that from removing autocentric uses to um, the language about um, ensuring that f future land uses provide pedestrian oriented um, design, et cetera, et cetera, um, and incorporating that into any area of, of the um, current world cap that currently references or has referenced in the past um, removal of auto centric uses, um, and specifically to further ensure that all language regarding the removal of auto centric businesses or um, causing autocentric businesses to become non-conforming is removed from the current draft of WOHAP, WOCAP, um, subject to one exception, which is that we would still consider the prohibition of drive-through restaurants and drive-through banks in the areas where um, removal of autocentric uses was previously recommended. Um, the next item to address is um, staff's recommendation on page 129 or 128 and 129 of the draft item 2C regarding the missing middle. I would recommend amending that to read as follows. In areas within one half mile of dart light rail stations, consider creating a zoning overlay using proposed conservation districts or creating new infill a new infra residential zoning category to permit missing middle housing types to be allowed by right adhering to architectural and urban design standards to be determined on a neighborhood basis but that aims to avoid displacement of existing area residents and homeowners 
development will be required to follow existing city codes related to ADUs, parking requirements, setbacks, and massing standards. And I would also like staff to add a note somewhere within the body of the um, tech, or recommend that staff add a note somewhere within the body of the WOCAP, um, noting that there has been opposition by certain community members to the existing of missing middle housing um, in the areas recommended um, by staff. And the final item that I would recommend adding is consider adding a part to the WOCAP um, that sets forth a time frame for frame for reevaluating um, the WOCAP, providing periodic updates on the WOCAP, um, or providing periodic updates on the WOCAP to members of the community and appropriate city bodies, boards, commissions, council, et cetera. Is there a second? Uh, can it, is there a comment allowed? I think I, I would have to have a second first. Is there a second? It's Dustin Mr. Bullard, I'm happy to second. Okay, with uh, motion made by Chair Rubin and a second by uh, Mr. Bullard, um, I'll entertain comments. Ms. McMahon? Thank you. Uh, Frankly, I followed you about halfway through and it got pretty complicated. And while I think that I'm aligned with the spirit of your motion, it's really difficult to follow that complex of a motion to really get fully behind it. Is there any way we can break that apart in pieces or provide something written so that we have the opportunity to really understand what your, your motion implies? I can certainly try to explain my motion, and I was planning to do that had I had I gotten a second. Maybe that would help, and then we could see if we still need to take additional measures to make sure the members of the body understand it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Rubin, do you have comments? Yes, yeah, sure. I've done three principal things here. First off, I want to thank all of the members of the community who came out today and who came out to the last meeting and for all of your time that you spent in connection with the WOCAP, both in city meetings and outside engaging members of the community, I applaud you for that. And your work doing that is, is so valuable and so important in the process. Um, through this, this public engagement process, I have heard several comments and criticisms of the draft of the WOCAP that I have tried to address through this motion. And hopefully I, I have come to a solution that, that is moving in the right direction. You know, this body is not the final word on WOCAP. You know, it goes to CPC, it goes to council as well. So there will be additional time to tweak these recommendations. But I hope that I have come to make some recommendations that will help make WOCAP a, a better fit and, and more acceptable to the members of this community. I'm not certain that I've gotten there, but again, I think it's important to put this motion out there to at least start the dialogue and hope that I'll be able to garner the support of the other members of this committee. Um, the first thing that I did was um, address the massive concerns that we've heard about language in this WOCAP causing autocentric uses to become non-conforming. Um, we have heard loud and clear that the community values these, these body shops, these auto repair shops, these car washes, and other businesses that have really become community institutions. And I don't think that this WOCAP should move in a way that eliminates these existing body shops or, or otherwise causes them to become non-conforming. So that's why I've gone with staff's language um, about, you know, not targeting any of these businesses to become non-conforming or, or eliminate them, but instead to consider and merely consider design standards that might be able to be implemented that allow these, these existing auto-oriented uses to coexist with walkable neighborhoods. Some, some members of the comment of the public had some very 
insightful comments about how you know, a lot of the reason that, that some of these neighborhoods aren't currently walkable is because of disinvestment from the city, and I, I agree with that completely. But I think if we need, if we are moving towards walkability, which includes a significant investment on the part of the city, we also need to consider design standards to find a solution that, that gets to walkability. And again, this is not a zoning change. This does not implement any specific design standards, but this allows that dialogue to go forward in an authorized hearing process should it be started. Um, the one thing that I did add back in there is to consider eliminating drive-throughs and drive-through restaurants and drive-through banks in those areas since I heard no opposition to eliminating those uses in the area. It was mainly the auto repair, body shop, so on and so forth uses. Um, the next thing that I addressed um, in my motion was to modify the language about missing middle housing. And again, I suggest the language that I did because I think that the conversation about missing middle housing needs to happen citywide, not just in the West Oak Cliff area plan, but in all areas of the city, considering the tremendous housing shortfall that we have. And any area plan that comes to this body, I'm going to insist that there is a serious element addressing um, consideration of missing middle housing going forward. Um, I, I believe that we're, that we're kind of in between a rock and a hard place right now, as, as other members of this body have suggested. We're already dealing with displacement issues in this area, so I think not considering any changes going forward um, is, is just as dangerous with insisting on making massive changes in this area. And again, this is not a zoning change. This is only allows the consideration of future um, changes in the area to potentially allow for missing middle housing. I also heard concerns um, very loudly and clearly about the addition of this missing middle housing leading to displacement in these areas. And that's why I have suggested adding language to the missing middle housing recommendation that when, if and when the addition of missing middle housing is considered, that the addition of missing middle housing aims to avoid displacement of existing area residents and homeowners. So when, when, if and when that authorized hearing happens, that anti-displacement principle is considered in the process. Um, and also we heard from members of the community that th some their discomfort about the addition of missing middle housing and transitioning from single family only. So I wanted to make sure that that voice is properly noted in this area plan um, so that when that authorized hearing, if and when that authorized hearing moves forward, that that's duly noted in the document and can be taken into account so it doesn't, so that, that it doesn't seem like there's a false sense of unanimity on that point. Um, the final piece I added in was just Ms. Nightingale's excellent suggestion that, that this body needs to, ex, uh, this, this document needs to expressly state that it needs to be reevaluated within an appropriate period of time and, and state how that reevaluation should occur both on the staff end, on the board and commission end, and on the um, community end as well. So with those comments, I, I hope that clarifies. I'm happy to take further questions from members of the body, but I, I hope that strikes an appropriate balance that will allow us to move this plan forward to the plan commission for additional consideration. Thank you. Does anyone else have any additional comments or questions? Mr. Houston? No? Um, I, have, I have a comment if no one else does. I, I'm not gonna be able to support the motion today. Um, I understand, uh, I agree with uh, a number of the points that uh, Chair Rubin has made, but um, as an equity issue, I'm not comfortable with um, moving to put forward an area plan that seems to be at 
uh, no, 180 degree disagreement with what the neighborhoods express wishes are. Because what I hear over and over again is that the neighborhoods want to protect their single family neighborhoods. And I think Chair Rubin is right in that we do need to have a broader city discussion of this because our only um, neighborhoods that um, don't exist near transit, are they gonna be able to have their protected single family neighborhoods, but the neighborhoods that, that are near transit um, are not allowed to have their, their single family neighborhood character maintained? Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I don't. I know that right now I cannot support moving an area plan forward that presents a ringing endorsement of upzoning and adding missing middle housing to an area that, where I hear over and over again that that was not what the neighborhoods wanted. That was not what the steering committee put forward. So I'm. I'm just simply not comfortable with that. Are there any other comments or questions? Um, Commissioner Popkin. Hey, Commissioner Carpenter, um, I, 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 I see both sides of what you both are saying. I know there is a great need for more density in our city, especially near transit. And I hear a lot of neighbors wanting to protect their single family neighborhoods. Um, and, uh, our neighborhood in particular has a lot of existing um, multifamily in small uh, homes that fit in well with our single family neighborhood. We've got a lot of missing middle that, that is, is just mixed in and has been here for a hundred years. The problem occurs when a, a current contemporary developer sees those development rights and what we end up with isn't always as context sensitive as what we are accustomed to seeing in our neighborhoods. And what I've heard throughout this process is that in some neighborhoods, there isn't this pushback to um, keep the neighborhood single family, but to allow the current mix of single family and missing metal to continue to exist, but that this neighborhood primarily um, north of the Tyler Vernon station has pushed back on that dramatically. And so I don't think that this is uh, an issue uh, with the WOCAP plan as a whole. I think this specific neighborhood has felt unheard on this specific issue. And I mean, maybe it is appropriate to have some transit stations that are in the middle of very walkable single family low density neighborhoods. And you know that's the way this neighborhood has existed for a long time. I ride my bike through the neighborhood. You know, it's, it's a mile to get to the train station, and I'm sure there are others who you know walk through these great walkable single-family neighborhoods to get to the train. So I don't think that there's necessarily a need to push this neighborhood into accommodating more density simply because they're next to a train station. But I agree with Commissioner Carpenter. This needs to be a city-wide conversation that we're having that as residents and neighbors, we should be able to identify the places where density is appropriate, which then also safeguards parts of the neighborhood where we don't want density to be. And I think often these types of decisions that we've made in plans, even including the Forward Dallas plan, aren't always stuck to in protecting the neighborhoods um, that are, you know, part of this compromise where some parts of the neighborhood get density and other parts of the neighborhood don't get density. And I think that's an important thing to remember is that, that we can have both and we don't, we don't want, you know, blanket changes across the city. And so what I'm hearing here is that there is a desire to continue to allow the missing middle that we have existing in this neighborhood already in many places to continue to exist and that there may not be an issue with new missing metal as long as it conforms to, you know, the architectural standards that would allow it to continue fitting into the neighborhood setbacks and other things that, that have been mentioned in the plan. Um, so I think barring, and I believe, I know Chair Rubin addressed that in his comments. I think it, it could be more strongly worded that um, this area in particular would like to stay single family rather than continue with staff recommendation of 
having more density around transit stations. I think that would be um, that a more strongly worded uh, and, and maybe a more consistent uh, message on that specific neighborhood uh, would help me feel more comfortable supporting this motion. So I don't have a vote. <laughs> I'll be having a vote when it comes to planning commission. Um, but thank you for uh, your time on this. Appreciate it. Are there any additional comments or questions? Um, Mr. Houston? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I need all commissioners who are online to please turn your camera on. We technically have six members present now. All right, can you all hear me? We did, but we just lost your camera. <laughs> oh no. I, you can't see you're, you're, Now you're back on, okay. Okay, great. Last meeting I was at, in attendance, I couldn't log, I couldn't unmute, and so I wanted to correct that this time. Um, I want to thank I want to thank everyone for the for their comments. I have two, um, two two concerns not concerns but two two points. One, um, I agree uh, wholeheartedly um, based on um, the community input. Not only this week but the last meeting I I, I, I saw I was I was not in attendance. Um, there's there's some some type of uh, disconnect between the plan and the community. Um, I do agree that we need to uh, have a, a plan uh, comprehensively uh, to address future housing. Um, and, and I, but I, I think that we need to uh, have this as a citywide discussion as well. Um, my second question is, uh, I believe Jerry Hawkins is, uh, can, you, can you ensure that Jerry Hawkins is available to vote because I know we're close to quorum. I think he said he had to step away. Um, so I just want to ensure that we're able to capture everyone. We, we do have quorum right now. Yes, we do have a question. Uh, for, uh, we do have a quorum at present, but I do not see uh, Mr. Hawkins present. Okay, so that's fine. We can still vote. Good I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I... Do we have a clarification as to our having a quorum? We do. Yes, we have gotten that now. So we do have a quorum. Okay. Mr. Houston, did you have additional comments or questions? No, uh, I'm, I, I really do want to, to uh, share that we do need to create a holistic plan um, because this is, uh, I, I was disturbed by seeing as much resistance as, as, as the last couple of meetings. Thank you, anyone else? If not, we have a motion to approve the WOCAP plan with the amendments read into the record by Chair Rubin and seconded by Mr. Bullard. All in favor, please say aye. 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 That's aye. Mr. Bullard. All right, that's three in favor. Everyone opposed? No. I see Mr. Houston and myself. Can we do a roll call vote? Mr. Price, if you have the, the, the. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Alrighty, uh, Brent Rubin? Yes. Deborah Carpenter? No. Jasmine Anderson? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jerry Hawkins? Kristen Nightingale? Yes. Linda McMahon? Yes. Lynette Aguilar? <clears throat> Matt Houston? No. Are there any other members present? This is Mr. Bullard. Uh, yes. Yes, that is um, four yeses to two noes. All right, the vote's four to two, the motion passes. Back to you, Mr. Mr. Chair. All right, I think that's it. Let me pull the agenda back up to make sure I haven't missed anything. All right, our next item is approval of the minutes from the June 14th um, meeting. Can I get a motion? 
I move to approve the minutes as submitted. Do we have a second? A second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Um, thank you all so much, everyone, for, for coming today. I hope you'll continue to participate in the process as this moves forward to the Plan Commission. And Council, your voices were, were very valuable and had a real impact on the way that this document and the recommendations made today. So I appreciate um, everyone coming out today. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Houston, seconded by um, Commissioner Carpenter. Um, to adjourn, it's not debatable. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion aye. carries. We stand adjourned at 11.33 a.m. Y'all have a good one.